Uh, welcome, everyone. It looks like the um, participants are starting to level off. So um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to what is the second hybrid meeting of the Committee on Increasing Diversity in the U.S. Ocean Studies Community. Um, before we jump into our agenda, um, I know there's a few folks online um, who might be new to the study or to the academy, so I just want to take a couple minutes to do a very quick overview. Um, next slide, please. I guess I should have started with, um, I'm Kelly Oskvig. <laughs> I'm a senior program officer for the Ocean Studies Board at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Um, and I am the study director for the study. Um, so in case you're not familiar with the, with the academies, um, we were first established by Pre uh, President Lincoln um, and we're referred to as NASM, or the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. We are nonprofit organizations with a mission to provide evidence-based unbiased advice on matters of scientific importance to the nation. NASM produces over 200 reports a year annually, as well as completes a number of other types of activities, calling on over 6,000 volunteer experts each year. The work is generally funded by the government. Um, some are legislatively mandated and others are commissioned by an agency. Um, and we also work with nonprofit institutions and industry or any uh, organization that's looking for objective independent advice. Um, next slide. For this particular study, um, the statement of task was developed by actually the Ocean Studies Board members, um, which is a, a bit of an unusual way for us to start. Um, so it was some, a topic that the board felt very passionately about. They developed a statement of task and then they, they talked to different agencies and organizations to, to gather up the funding to, um, to support this. Um, so this is the statement of task. There's a lot of words on there. Um, we can put the, the link to the website. Um, in the in the chat, but basically we're looking to um, to, to provide uh, a strategy, a coordinated strategy across ocean studies to increase um, diversity and inclusion, belonging, accessibility, and justice in the ocean studies community, with an emphasis on um, really increasing racial and ethnic diversity. Understanding that we can't do everything all in one um, study, so that's our emphasis. But we're looking at the intersection of um, of inclusion, belonging, accessibility, and justice as well. Um, we're looking at analyzing past policies and strategies, what works, what doesn't work. We're looking at collecting existing narratives, perhaps collecting new narratives. Um, we're looking at developing this, this strategy again, and um, really a strategy towards action that not only the federal agencies can take, but across ocean studies, actions that they can take to truly make a difference in um, the, the diversity and inclusion that we're seeing in ocean studies. And then lastly, we want to identify metrics to evaluate progress. So this is very action focused. Um, next slide, please. Quick overview of the project. Um, this is a 24 month consensus study. Um, consensus means it's authored by the full committee. We have 15 um, excellent committee members um, representing all different um, walks of ocean studies. Um, and so the, the end, end report will be a peer reviewed study that is um, with recommendations and conclusions that are authored by that committee. Um, our sponsors, oh shoot, I need to update this. <laughs> um, we're very excited to also have the National Science Foundation on board. Um, so we, we've got the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the Office of Naval Research and the National Science Foundation who we'll hear about actually um, in a few minutes at 11 following this discussion. Um, again, we have a committee of 15 experts. We're gonna tackle this statement of task through a series of four hybrid two-day meetings. This is the second one. We also have monthly virtual meetings um, and these meetings have both open or public sessions and closed sessions. So the open or public, basically anytime someone comes to talk to us, it's usually for information gathering to enrich our conversations, that meeting becomes public. Um, it's recorded, it's put it on our website. Um, and materials presented to us are included in a public access file. Um, we also have closed meetings if that is just for the committee and staff to deliberate and to really talk in closed session to develop their conclusions and recommendations. Um, and so all of this work will be uh, released in a report, again, that is peer reviewed um, to the public in the summer of 2025. Next slide, please. Ah, here's our committee members. Um, Again, we'll put that link in the chat and you can look at their bios, it's all online. Um, 
I don't want to take any more of our time. Uh, sorry, committee members. <laughs> I think everyone's fine with that. Um, okay, so next slide, please. And then here's our project timeline. Um, as I said, uh, we've got four meetings. We're in the second. Um, our next hybrid meeting will be in October um, and our final hybrid meeting in February of 2025, which allows us for a spring peer review. Um, and then the final report due in the summer of 2025. Uh, next slide, please. And then if you wanna stay up to date with our activities, please enter your email address um, in this website. Um, and we can, we've already put this website in the chat, I believe. Um, you can contact me, uh, my, my email address is up there. Um, I can put that in the chat as well. If you have anything that you'd like to share with the committee, um, we are building a community. We wanna hear from everyone. Um, and uh, we just really look forward to, to continuing this process. Um, so please do stay up to date and subscribe and um, you'll have, get emails with um, information on how to join upcoming events. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so quickly the agenda, we're going to start today with Jennifer Silver, um, and she'll be uh, talking a bit about the history and context for the lack of DEI in ocean studies. Um, we'll then hear a few words from our new sponsor, NSF. Um, we're then going to take a break from the public session until 1 p.m. Um, Pacific, where we'll have a workshop run by Kendall Moore at, um, from University of Rhode Island on um, collecting narratives. So we're really excited about all of this. And then tomorrow, um, we have a three-hour public session on getting additional perspectives from underrepresented groups in ocean studies. Um, and with that, I think we can turn it over to Amelia, who is moderating this next session. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I just want to introduce um, our um, colleague and guest, I'm Jennifer Silver. And bef but quickly before that, I want to explain why we've invited her here briefly. Um, we're trying to understand um, a little bit of the historical context of ocean studies um, broadly. Um, and Jennifer is going to give us um, a bit of a, a window into some of that as it relates to fisheries, is my understanding. Um, Jennifer comes to us from the University of Guelph, uh, where she is a professor and associate chair in geography, environment, and geomatics in the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences. And just very briefly, um, her work specializes in ocean governance, fisheries management, coastal communities, and settler colonialism, digital technology and environmental change, and political ecology. And so I would like to just hand it over to Jennifer at this time. Thank you so much. Uh, it is such a pleasure to, first of all, can every, everybody can hear me? That's all good. Great. I do have slides, which I'll turn to in a second, but I just wanted to thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be here to see faces, some that I know, names, more names that I know, but that I have never met before. Uh, and so this is just, yeah, a really delightful event to be participating in and to be asked to, uh, to speak to you all and, and I look forward to conversation more than anything else. I do have some slides. So the hardest part of any online presentation, I think, is making sure that you can see my slides. <laughs> um, so can, I can't now, I've switched into slide mode. I'm just curious, can you see them? Can somebody tell me verbally? Because I can't see. Not yet. Can't see you. All good? No, we are not seeing your slides. Oh, you're not seeing my slides. Shoot. Oh, you know what? I need to share my screen. That's why. Now we can see them. Okay, awesome. And I will do this. Good. Perfect. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, okay. So I would want to begin um, most talks, but especially a talk like this, by uh, acknowledging that I live and work in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples and the treaty lands and territory of the Mississauga of the credit of the First Nations. Um, and I have the great pleasure and honor of traveling to the west coast of Canada often. And so when I'm visiting there and attending meetings and collaborating, I have the opportunity to be in the territory, traditional territories of various coastal First Nations. 
Um, in particular, I owe a lot and have longstanding bonds with various communities of the Nachanal First Nations whose land and sea territories are on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So as I've heard in the intro to the session today, and as I read through your materials online, it strikes me you're being address, asked to address challenging topics, um, which is really, that are really important. And that the invitation and some of the funding um, and opportunity for you to, to work together as a, as a committee um, come from institutions that wield a great deal of power and funding in the realm of oceans and science and natural resources um, that themselves have complex histories. And so um, I think that that's, yeah, that's, that's a really an interesting feature and important part of the work that you're doing. So you're uh, looking to understand inequities, account for them, offer suggestions. Um, and I'm humbled that you would think to invite me. Um, if the invitation, to be honest, gave me a bit of pause because there's there are lots of ways to think and talk about these things um, and lots of excellent people out there doing amazing research, organizing and advocacy. And I did recommend a couple names and I'm happy to recommend other names if that becomes of interest. Um, and the setting as I understand it today, of course, is formal. This is information gathering in the important work that you're doing, but also conversational. And I think it's important to, for me to situate a little bit of who I am and where I come from, um, because I think that helps to demonstrate kind of my positionality and, and my own personal experiences and what I'm bringing to the table in the conversation um, from a personal and professional standpoint. So I wanted to start there by saying that I identify as a woman, um, family on my mother's and father's sides have lived in the place that's now called Canada for between four to six generations. And then further beyond that, uh, we trace relations to England, Ireland, and Belgium. So my family history is entwined with and a, and a part of the history of settler colonialism in Canada. I'm a woman who works in the academy um, and in the re ocean research community. And so in this sense or in this um, part of my life, I have uh, encountered gender stereotypes um, harass forms of harassment, structural barriers, at the same time that whiteness has softened my experience and that I benefit from privileges common to um, my upbringing. So I experience privilege on the one hand and marginality in the other and in different ways that relate to facets of my identity. And everybody in this room and on the call um, has this mixture of privilege and mar marginality, although, of course, in different ways. Um, so it was really important for me to start off with that, just so that um, you have a sense of who I am and, and how I come to the conversation today. Um, so I, I uh, in reading your materials, the term ocean studies community is of course broad. Um, and then I imagine that's intentional in the context of your study <laughs> and intended to encompass numerous, numerous different disciplines and professional fields and ultimately workplaces. Um, and as was mentioned, by virtue of my background and the work that I do, I'm going to be building my comments today around fisheries and fisheries science and research sort of that's considered to be um, part of or adjacent to kind of fisheries um, and coastal communities more broadly. I think that there will be broader generalizations or takeaways um, that I'll build as the talk goes on, but I just wanted to um, draw attention to the fact that because of my background, I'll be speaking to fisheries and fisheries science. So the federal agency responsible for the lion's share of commercial fisheries management in Canada defines fisheries science as, quote, bringing together ecology, mathematics, statistics, population dynamics, marine biology to better understand fish stocks um, and fisheries so that they can be managed. So I thought in preparation for the talk or putting it together today, I would look and may well have, have or will come across research like this in the literature that looks at diversity um, in the workplace, in the workforce. So this paper by Arismendi and Penanula uh, searched faculty web pages and did a request for information act for information about um, federal employees. And, and they found that women and racialized minorities are underrepresented in both universities and in, in federal agencies where fishery science is, is done. And the author suggests that this is, quote, likely because of systemic biases and cultural barriers. Uh, and I won't go through the tables there, but you can see that, um, purport, like, considering uh, against the general population that there's an underrepresentation of both women 
racialized minorities. So fishery science is the focus of the presentation, but it doesn't take long to look into and find other work um, that, that looks at ocean science more broadly. So there's another paper there on the bottom of the left of the slide um, that found that 87% uh, of awardees of ocean science PhDs in 2016 were, were white, while 13% were racialized minorities. So this is, I'm sure, like of the sort of data and information that that you have been collected, collecting and will continue to. And the Arismendi and Penanula paper call for attention to things like mentors and role models in the workplace, uh, anti-bias training and approaches in recruitment and hiring, eliminating barriers um, to it for advancement, putting policies in place that care that give flexibility and support for caregiving that often falls to women and racialized minorities. And I think these are all really, really important. And I, I imagine that when a year or so from now, when I read your report, I will read suggestions around these sorts of um, uh, urgent amendments and, and, and supports being built into the workplace. And I also, so to get to the history part of things, which is where I'm gonna turn. And I think um, what I heard today and what I anticipated is the reason for the invitation. Um, so I don't want to disappoint there. I'm going to suggest that on the, you know, a part of it is certainly amendments and supports in the workplace um, that institutions like universities and federal agencies and NGOs can do and have been doing more of. Um, and in the bigger picture, there's also an accounting for history and the de co development of institutions and science and social science and information considered to be important for decision making so the that institutional history and science and history of science um almost a reckoning with that that institutions can and should be doing um sort of the how the objectives of the institution the, the processes of the institution created the conditions for this inequity in the first place so the main thrust of my points in the remainder of the slides is that suggestions you might want to bring forward with respect to supports in the workplace can be paired with a call for attention to histories and this almost co-development or institutionalization of particular forms of knowledge production within institutions that are um, given the authority to make decisions, important decisions about oceans and fish and uh, all the things that, that our research considers. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some questions that I think people, the public, are asking of institutions and that institutions can be asking internally of themselves, um, like around pluralism, considerations of different forms of knowledge and knowledge systems, for example. So um, this paper that you see the abstract or the title and authors of on the right hand side um, is one that was a real pleasure in many ways to write. Um, and it couldn't have been written without the other co-authors that you see there, we each brought something um, to that paper and the story that we tell tries to trace some of this history of the development of fishery science and its institutionalization within um, Western agencies that are given the authority to make decisions about fish. So that's, again, I imagine some of what's behind the invitation for me to be here today. So without spending too much of a time like going through that whole paper, I'm happy to answer questions about it. I thought I would just read you a couple of quotes from it that hopefully give you the sense for where we land in it. Um, so we, in thinking about and tracing some of this history, we write, quote, as fisheries industrialized around the world, Countries clamored to extend their geopolitical reach, secure access to distant stocks, and protect domestic fisheries and fleets. For political economic reasons, the United States and other Western countries, and I would include Canada in this, um, strongly favored knowing and representing fish in aggregate uh, and or as biomass. So understandings and approaches from fishery science developed and evolved, were taken up and are now institutionalized within state-led agencies. Um, notably single species models that feed into structured decision-making and evaluation processes. And what's interesting is that these outcomes are um, typically and, and in many ways rightfully described as a matter of the best available science being adopted by state agencies. 
concerned with economic development and responsible for conservation. And then at the same time, though, we're inspired by a lot of literature, by science and technology studies, those that study the philosophy of science, history of science. Um, uh, the scholar we refer to here is Max Le Boron, who's a Métis scholar, who says that at the same time that this is the, the state of the field in the science, we have to understand and think about how that science reflects directly particular outlooks. So in the case of fishery science, as it was institutionalized, uh, post-war ideas about modernization and industrialization, sets of relationships that are um, normal, typical to capitalism and objectives such as the globalization of food systems. So it's not to say that the science is bad, but we have to recognize how it reflects particular ideas, outlooks, values, objectives. We're in very good company. Uh, lots of people are thinking about these things. I put up a couple papers here of other colleagues on the West Coast, particularly a lot of the folks that I know and work with, and then and also and I'm really inspired by uh, their work. Think about the ways in which the fisheries science and the institutions that manage fisheries kind of cons are very um, structured, uh, top down, and how this con constrains or challenges the integration or weaving together of different ways of knowing and managing fish and objectives that people might have for fish, particularly in, in the case of the work that I do with other people and that these authors here do with uh, Indigenous communities. So I want to say here that by no means is that paper of ours the only <laughs> on this topic. I think there's it's a really exciting time for literature that's thinking about and through these things. So to the point of, or to the part of my talk where I wanted to, um, if I can give you some advice or some thoughts as to what um, you might recommend or how you could frame suggestions to institutions, including universities, again, not just government agencies, universities, NGOs. Um, I think there are, well, there are more than three questions, but there are three questions that I want to highlight that are being asked of institutions and that institutions can ask of themselves. So what forms of knowledge are privileged and influence decision-making? And conversely, which ones are less privileged and don't have as much influence in decision making? Do legal structures and institutional processes marginalize folks, some groups of folks? Um, and if so, who are they? And how does that happen? And does the governance system and management processes, or do the governance system and management process that we oversee? So it could be a fisheries management system. If it's a university, it could be an undergraduate program training fishery scientists. Uh, does it enjoy legitimacy? Uh, and so does it, is it seen as legitimate by a variety of rights holders, stakeholders, the general public? And does it accommodate or resist pluralism? So does it accommodate different ways of knowing? Is it, is it flexible? Is it wanting to um, work with, integrate, weave together with, uh, recognize, or is it resistant to that? So just quickly, again, pertaining to my little, uh, my world of fisheries and fishery science, science um, and considerations of, of, these, of these sorts of spaces and communities and so on. I think I wanted to say here that there's a lot of really interesting and important work by social scientists, scientists, indigenous scientists and scholars that are really interesting and important and shed light on decision-making, on community objectives and values, on observations of fish and other um, non-human species at local scales that are at least within the way that um, decision-making about fisheries are institutionalized are seen to be outside of decision-making, the type of information typically considered to be necessary to make decisions about stocks of fish. Um, and so there's an element of it just acknowledging that there are some forms of knowledge privileged, others less so, and that there's a dis dis disparity sometimes in what gets to influence decision making. Of course, changing that is a very difficult process, but institutions can simply ask themselves what forms of knowledge are privileged in this institution or these processes that we oversee, and should we be broadening that umbrella? 
Um, the question of legal structures and institutional processes, I'll just use um, the Pacific region jurisdiction that I'm most familiar, familiar with because of my own research. There are clear points in time that are well documented, not just in my work and other people's work, where there's been a sort of the um, formation and implementation of a very structured approach to managing fisheries. Um, you know, the period of time where European explorers and colonialists arrived, when the fisheries are being industrialized, when the decision is taken to limit the number of licenses and turn to individual transferable quotas. These are points in time where combination of law, policy, institutional processes have meant that on one hand, the, the kind of particular types of economic efficiencies and conser conservation objectives are being per pursued, but there are trade-offs happening where some people are being marginalized out of fisheries, indigenous communities, are their access to food fish is being reduced. So it's the question of what processes uh, are happening and how do they marginalize some? How do they benefit others and institutions? Certainly people are asking this of institutions and institutions can ask this of themselves. This is along the same lines, but pointing to a, another piece of research that really hits home that in the Pacific jurisdiction, there are a small number of entities, companies mostly that hold significant portfolios of fishing licenses and that those are very expensive, essentially assets. And the flip side to this, so there, there's some beneficiaries of the current system of allocation of fisheries. The flip side to this is that new entrants, uh, small scale fish harvesters, um, indigenous people who wish to be involved in commercial fishing, the prospect of building a portfolio of license and licenses of this size and cost is a very daunting um, prospect. So this question again of how do legal structures, institutional processes marginalize is one that institutions can ask of themselves. And then do the processes, the system and processes being overseen enjoy legitimacy? This is simply to say that there are, um, uh, you know, the system again in the context of fisheries, hierarchical top-down informed by particular types of science and knowledge and just because of this is institutionalized and quite prevalent and obvious to us doesn't mean that there aren't other systems and other objectives for fisheries and other systems for management fish that, you know, they don't go away simply because there's a, a federal fisheries management agency. And so um, in a world where questions are being asked about um, whether and how Indigenous rights to fish in the in the case of the jurisdiction I'm familiar with, indigenous rights to fish um, ought to be recognized. Um, questions about the legitimacy of the current system as it works um, increase. And so does the current system accom accommodate those questions, uh, accommodate different ways of seeing and knowing fish or do they resist that? And decisions can be made internal to the uh, institution about that. And there are different outcomes that result um, could be, and those outcomes could be increased tension, protest, or so on. Um, but these are these are the circumstances that it's I think would be helpful to suggest institutions, organizations to reflect a little bit on, knowing that they have the ability to, um, yeah, to make decisions that either resist or accommodate something like the request for pluralism, more pluralistic approaches. So to begin to wrap or to wrap up. Um, I, I found this quote um, because there's, you know, there's always this pushback about the objectivity of science um, and how challenging it is to, to weave or integrate social science, indigenous knowledge. Um, and so, yeah, this, I think that this is just a reminding us or what I wanted to do is to, to remind us that there, there are along with these traditional epistemic values promoting the attainment of truth, um, objectivity, that we need to think about objectivity as being achieved in part, possibly through diversity and inclusion of different um, viewpoints, forms of knowledge, and that we can, that increases the opportunity for um, mutual respectful criticism um, and safeguarding against individual and group biases. And that over time, this actually can improve um, decisions and make institutions more legitimate, make them more open to different forms of knowledge and hopefully places that people 
of a wider diverse, diversity of backgrounds see themselves as wanting to work in and be to be part of. So I'll end there, say thank you for the invitation again and look forward to the, the conversation. Thank you so much. Um, Jennifer, I think if we have another 30 minutes, yes, for discussion, um, and I can help moderate that, but I think people should just feel free to um, participate or and ask questions. Remember, we're thinking about historical context here. So one of the things that we heard that might be relevant for our own framings of historical context in our, in our document or questions that we are outstanding for us still about that. Um, I think the, the fisheries perspective is actually reflective of uh, a lot of trends in ocean sciences more broadly. Um, so even though it's kind of some of the examples or things are particular to a fisheries context, the kind of larger trends that are um, that you touched on are, are, are more broadly applied as well. Just to keep that in mind too. Um, thank you so much for that, Jennifer. Um, since we do have a lot of time, I was wondering if you could go back to, there was a slide about midway through your presentation where you broke fisheries management history into four errors. Um, more or less, including um, industrialization, uh, indigenous management, um, ITQs. Could you go back to that? And if um, if you can just go through those errors and maybe tell us in a little bit more detail, like the stories of what existence would have looked like in each era and which people were um, in power, losing power, gaining and losing as we move through those things. So it just becomes a little bit more, more flesh on the bone of that. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to expand. Um, so, well, again, I offered this slide most uh, directly to the Pacific region of the West Coast fisheries as managed by Canada. Although I think that these four bullet points that I've highlighted pertain to maybe not exactly on the same timeline, but to other jurisdictions as well. I think about New Zealand, Australia, um, I'm sure, you know, parts of the U.S. as well. Um, whereas, so the first, the first bullet point is to say um, on the West Coast of what is now Canada, people have been there, um, it's suggested at least 14,000 years. <laughs> um, archaeological records and oral history that people share um, suggests very strongly that uh, Indigenous peoples were using, managing, cultivating um, shellfish, fish, um, and trading those, those species up and down the coast. Um, so it is not simply um, people just encountering uh, a clam on the beach and and harvesting it, but actually, in the case of shellfish, it's a great example, cultivating clam beds, rolling rocks to the very edge of the intertidal to create more um, productive habitat for shellfish, so very active intervention. And then that, that use and management, as I understand from stories that I hear and things that I've read and archeology span that I've read, um, that those systems are, were overseen by um, uh, bit like families and other sort of hereditary systems of, of chiefs and, and, and family members and, and so on with very specific roles for caring different, for different parts of the, um, the ecosystem. Um, and that, so there, are, it's a, it is a governance system um, that was in place. So the productivity of, of the intertidal, the ability to go out and harvest fish was tied to a governance system and overseen by a governance system. Um, in the case of the West Coast of Canada, uh, Europeans started to arrive, explorers are arriving in the 
1700s, if not earlier than that. Um, initially sort of exploration, but with a commercial intent, of course. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, BC came into Canada 1867, I believe. And the way that I read the history written by historians uh, of fisheries in, in Canada um, is that it was really after BC entered into Canada that the industrialization of fisheries for trade became a really uh, keen interest of the newly formed government of Canada, particularly trade of salmon back to, to um, England and other parts of Europe. Uh, and it's very important to note here that for this period of time and into the early 1900s that indigenous, um, many indigenous people were actually very active and important players within commercial fisheries. They had knowledge of the coastline, um, lived in many, in many instances, people live near the coastline. Um, and the, and then, uh, I mean, I'm, glo I'm glossing over quite a bit here, right. But the period of time where I think that this question of the institutionalization of science, fisher, a particular form of fishery science aligns with like the 1950s and sixties onward, where basically economic efficiencies, um, and the overall, uh, harvests and the overall profitability of harvest become a really important objective. Um, and so in order to do that, the idea of limiting the number of licenses, so like limiting access to fisheries um, and managing allocation, as well as making it easier to manage harvest by having a lot fewer boats on the water and having the question of who holds quota kind of taken care of through market transactions. So that's the idea of transferable quota. Um, that's when it becomes more expensive to gain access to fisheries. Um, and a whole other slew of things start to happen that make it such that indigenous folks, um, non-indigenous folks from coastal communities who own and operate their own vessels, there's research to show that these are the people that are most often marginalized as a result of those, those decisions in this particular form of fisheries management. Thank you. Yeah. So how would you describe um, this trend over time? Like if we're just going to, we can just, we can stay in the um, Pacific Canadian context, which is fine, because again, I think it applies. Um, oh, and there's also a question in the um, thing. But I, but I want to, how, how would you describe that kind of trend over time? Like if, if you were going to try to summarize it. <laughs> Um, um, or could you summarize it? Uh, pertaining to the, to the marginalization piece? Yeah. Well, I mean, would you even, would you describe it as a, as a history of marginalization? Is that a good way to frame it? I mean, I think I don't want to speak for, uh, you know, in, indigenous communities or necessarily for small scale owner operators, but I do sp speak with them a lot. And I think the, ex I think it's fair to say that there are number, great numbers of people on the coast who have experienced those periods of time as marginalization, right? So on the one hand, and again, I don't, I don't want to say, uh, there's no part of this talk is that's meant to say that the science is a bad science it tells us lots of things but there are people who are experienced these periods of time where the institution is saying our main objectives pertain to like conservation of the resource and the science is getting better and better we're doing more and more to monitor at the same time that that's happening people are experiencing marginalization from the fishery so that's a you know if you're in a small coastal community on on the west coast of vancouver island and your family members and generations of folks have been able to go out and catch fish for food and trade. And then that is not a possibility anymore. You experience that as a marginalization at the same time that a very powerful institution is saying, but this is the best available science and we have, we're serving the objectives of conservation.
Uh, let's go with Ken and then Javier. Ken, I think you're muted. Oh. Thanks, Jennifer, for your presentation and your answer so far, very illuminating. I know that as scientists, and in my case as a social scientist, we study the present and we are uninformed about history generally. And I know historians make the case that it's important to understand history to see the deeper undercurrents of things going on in the present that we don't study and we don't discern, but that may really provide insights into what's really going on. In your looking at the history and reading historians, are there some key insights, some key aspects of undercurrents of what's beneath the current arrangement or what's beneath the marginalization that we that have been revealed? Um, I mean, maybe you've said them all already, but I'm wondering how you would address that question. Is it worth studying history? Have we seen <laughs> things and understood things that we would otherwise not see and not understand? Because we're in the present and we study the present. Yeah, thank you, Ken, for that. Um, I love reading history. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, speaking personally, I find it very valuable. I think in the work that you're doing as a committee, it is it is very valuable. And and one one additional thing that I would bring up, your question brings up for me, um, and that I can speak to again in the context context of the jurisdiction I know best, but I think it it plays out in other places is. To think about history increasingly in the and what pe the way people have been writing about history uh, and what it illuminates in the last say ten to fifteen years is our categories of gender and race and the way that particular um, activities or like in um, insufficiencies are ascribed to people based on categories of gender and race. So this is actually there's only been a little bit written about it. Um, on the west coast of Canada, but um, uh, a period of time, there there's a lot of uh, racism towards Japanese fishermen on the west coast, and like uh, for for reasons that are much larger than the fisheries <laughs> um, that history can tell us all about, you know, pertaining to world wars and geopolitics and whatnot. But that like that certain characteristics or traits of fishing. Uh, or waste of fish, for example, were ascribed more commonly to people of Japanese heritage. And I think that, and I and I see this also forms of stereotypes and racism um, pertaining to indigenous fish harvesting and uses of fish. And, and actually so much so that indigenous harvest practices have ultimately been criminalized um, like there's there's some types of of fish weirs and nets, for example, that indigenous people can't use in commercial fishing because they're not recognized as permissible fishing gear. Um, so I think, yes, history is worth considering absolutely. And I think history and historians are doing a great job of teasing apart the ways in which categories of race and gender have uh, particular, activities, deficiencies, or what, whatnot have been ascribed to race and gender um, incorrectly and inappropriately over time. So that's, an, that's another thing that your question allows me to add um, that is a, certainly of relevance to your, to your work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Javier, please go ahead. Yeah, so I was just going to go back a little bit to the point on marginalization, although, um, <clears throat> and provide some some illustrations, although Jen just did that um, to a certain extent. Um, it's good to see you, Jen, have the opportunity yeah, to interact. Sure. Um, I mean, for me, it's useful to, although categorizations are always a little bit problematic, um, look at small scale versus large scale fisheries, because most of the science, Western science that has been developed to manage our fisheries has been thinking of this larger scale, single species in, in the global north. Um, and as we learn more about small scale producers and we learn that they produce almost half of the catch around the world, we're realizing that most of the science doesn't apply to to the global south or to marginalized populations that are fishing 
for many other motivations, but you know, not only to you know build economically, but they're making trade-offs in in many different ways and and putting a lot of values into play. So, so, um, and and so for instance, an example is a lot of the certification schemes we have. Um, they really don't apply to this type of fisheries and and further marginalize them, right? Because they mm -hmm. cannot. Uh, they cannot reach the certification schemes because they're expensive, because they need to apply a certain science that doesn't apply to them and further marginalizes their ability to compete in, in certain markets. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I'm not sure if there was a question wrapped up in there. No, um, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, 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 I think that certification schemes are a great are a great example, not just um, as it pertains to marginalization of small scale and global uh, fishers in the global south, but I think it plays winners yeah. and losers in yeah. the US and Canada as well. I guess my comment or question is, you know, I see Western science as one of the major issues, and I don't know in your revision of history, if Western science development for fisheries is one of the parting points that that explains this marginalization, or or will you put other issues, you know, as as very relevant as well? Um, yeah, I think yeah. I think that this is an example of a science. Um, ascending at the same time as industrialization and then before that like the co very colonialism that allowed for um or that some cases violently like kind of disconnected indigenous peoples from their territories and resources so like it's not to say that the science mm -hmm. and capital and industrialization are the only thing like there's a history prior to that that i think colonialism is very important but i think yeah so i i wouldn't say that the science is the the cause but it is part of the under understanding the kind of like constellation of events and that really seeing that as now embedded in institutions i think is a real important recognition it, it pertains to um deci decision making and marginalization in that sense but then the point I tried to make at the start of the talk I was trying to figure out how to do it is that I think for to your to your what you're being asked about in some ways of like how to encourage more people of different backgrounds to come into and to stay into ocean research. If people don't see diverse values and objectives recognized and reflected in the science that they're doing, then why would they want to, if they feel like their science is going to marginalize people, why would they want to stay in that science mm -hmm. or work in that? Mm -hmm. So I think that there's that piece to it that's really important to make the connection. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Jean, please go ahead. And then Paul. Jennifer, thank you very much for your presentation. Appreciate all of that. Um, I'm not sure that the question I'm going to ask bears so much on the study, but it's certainly come, something that comes to me personally. And, and Wendy, you may have some things to answer to it or add to it. I'm wondering in the historical, if there's also some sort of cultural um, aspect to gender participation in fisheries. And I asked that I have a friend doing a historical study of uh, crabbing on the Chesapeake and can't really find any pictures of young girls, women working in the boats as uh, they're doing the crabbing. And I, I'm just wondering when I look at the Yugoslav um, oystermen of the Gulf Coast and such, are there or have there been some cultural limitations with the idea of young girls and women participating? And if so, have those actually dissipated a bit as we moved forward with the Me Too kind of uh, women's generation? Yeah, well, thanks. I hadn't anticipated this one, um, but it is an important question, so thank you. Uh, uh, yes, I certainly think that there are cultural norms and expectations pertaining to gender that shape who is particip who participates in fisheries or or in cert of certain types, and how maybe as a young woman growing up, even in a fishing family, like certain parts of the fishery are seen to be the do domain of the one. So I think shore work, like processing work, um, in well, in the west in the west coast of Canada and in other places that I've read about, that often 
the cultural norms and sort of expectations of women are sort of shape or direct them towards the shore work processing work. I also think that there's an interesting thing to note of. Uh, I've seen some literature, I'm trying to think which, I think it's, it is from the global south of where there are certain types of fish and shellfish, shellfish gleaning that women do typically do. And then in turn, though, that particular food source is seen le like less culturally valued than say some of the larger fish species that men tend to catch. So there's also this like co-constitution of um, gender and preference or like privileging of certain fish types. So like the shellfish, which are very nutritionally important, maybe aren't like held in as high as esteem as some fish that you have to go out far offshore to catch. Um, if the committee is interested in literature in that line, I can search it out. We're, we're getting out to the very edge of where I feel like I can speak confidently to, but I certainly feel like, yeah, the gender and, and gender roles in fisheries is, is something that is certainly, um, yeah, exists and that there's literature that speaks to. So, so I, 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 <laughs> um, so you're talking about how you know the the rise of industrialization and fishery science sort of coincided, and that you know a lot of that was uh, an extension of early colonial practices, and I, I see how through the policy and legal frameworks that we have now that you know, regulate these, these large scale fisheries, how some of these um, uh, inequities that, that marginalize uh, indigenous communities, um, you know, get canalized into the system in a way that's, that's hard to disrupt. So my question for you is, are there two or three things that you could think of, you know, like understanding the scale of, you know, the the legal structures that are in place are there two or three th areas where um progress could be made that would help start dismantling some of those barriers um that maintain the marginalization yes thank you for that tricky question um well, a couple a couple of things I would say is that uh, in other work, and actually I spoke to an academies committee la last summer that was looking into access and equity and commercial fisheries and like basically how to better pursue more access for a wider range of folks. And so something that I would say there and I've said, said elsewhere is I do think that kind of like unregulated markets for licenses and quota while efficient to administer um, and contributing probably to kind of like uh, economic viability of some of the largest scale players, uh, it's it's they are a challenge because it becomes harder and harder for folks to to buy into that system. There are questions that I would have about like foreign foreign fun financing and foreign investors and so on. So like regulating, like better regulation, understanding regulation of license and quota markets and jurisdictions that rely on markets would be one. Uh, a second, this is just off the top of my head, but I do, I see in the Pacific region, uh, this, this question of like criminalization of indigenous fishing techniques, uh, where it's just simply like, the, the traditional fish weirs, for example, is like people are not able to employ those really even on an experimental scale. There might be a couple instances, but so figuring out ways in which traditional fishing practices can be, even if it's just on more of an experimental scale, um, used and employed, because those are opportunities not just to catch fish, but to have youth and elder come together to learn from one another, all sorts of, so I hear lots of colleagues um, saying in various ways and places like the criminalization of certain techniques and not others is a, is a challenge. Um, so those are two, do I have a third? I might, I probably could come up with a third, but I think I'll, I'll stop there for sake of time. And because I, 
Yeah, it is a really difficult question. Really difficult. Um, Wendy. Yeah, I was going to go back to the last question on gender. Um, I'm Alaska Native Haida, and in Southeast Alaska, at least, we're Clinkett Haida and Simpson, and we don't have those gender roles um, separated um, for harvesting, whether it's um, plants, animals, hunting, fishing, we don't, we don't have those gender roles and um, discrepancies between who can do what and the value placed on the food resources. I think it's really going to be, that, that's, a, that's a question for specific communities. It's, it's going to vary a lot across um, indigenous communities. Uh, and that's going to be based on cultural norms, whether you're um, a matriarchal community society or not. So I think it's, it's a really, you have to get to know the community to know um, how the protocols and practices for those communities. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. I really appreciate that. And I think it's also a demonstration of how uh, gender roles are really co constructs of culture over time, right? They don't, there's nothing natural about them. <laughs> they are, they are, what society makes them. I think we have about three more minutes. So any, any concluding thoughts or um, Jennifer, anything further that you'd want us to like take away or you know really drill down on as a committee when it comes to trying to frame historical context for our yeah, I mean, I think Wendy's point is super important. And I was uh, one of the reasons why I, I had gave pause to the invitation is I really didn't want it to become a, like, I'm very mindful that you have to truly understand how this touches down and plays out in place, like really being attentive to um, and doing your, doing your work and doing your reading and understanding and talking and listening to people in place is the only way to know how it plays out in place. So that's really important. And to say that, I think, um, yeah, this this connection that I tried to make early in the talk between retaining people and making workplaces places where pe lots of different pe people want to stay and work is tied to the work that that institution or that organization does. I think increasingly so, people want to feel like where they're working is a reflection of, to an extent, um, values or the ways that they would see right and wrong. And so I do wonder whether like maintain uh, retaining folks in agencies, universities is, is in part about making the work that those institutions and agencies do reflective of, of values, a wider range of values. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Take care, everybody. Good luck with the study. <laughs> oh, Ken has one last. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, I just saw one last raised hand. Ken, did you wanna? Oh no, that was a thumbs up. Just a thumbs up. <laughs> thumbs up and claps all around. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Thanks everyone, take care. Have a great rest of your day. Um, all right, so um, now we're moving on. We've got a few minutes um, uh, to hear some, some thoughts from, from the National Science Foundation. So we have Lisa Rahm on the line, um, and I'm not sure if I see Jim uh, McManus yet, but Lisa, um, do you want to? I think I saw Jim just enter the room. Okay. Jim, Jim is here. <laughs> Hi, welcome both of you. Thank um, you. Thank you, and thanks for having us. So I, I, uh, I, I'll go ahead and um, offer a few comments. Uh, I'm Lisa Rome. I'm the program director <clears throat> for uh, a variety of education programs um, in the geosciences and including the ocean education program. And Am I running the slide? I... We can oh, see. Sorry. Great. Um, so 
I, I'd like to highlight uh, some of the programs that NSF Geosciences Directorate has supported over the years to give you some context for um, what we're hoping that um, the co committee will provide advice on. And um, uh, we've, we've certainly been worried about um, the, we've been focused on diversity in the geosciences since 2001. And we've had programs that have supported opportunities to enhance diversity in geosciences, for example. Um, and um, one of the notable things about these programs has been the, the uh, change over time. So the first decade with the opportunities for diversity was really an experimental time. And um, we supported projects that had a variety of audiences and a variety of age levels. Um, so, so there was a break in 2014, and then we started again in 2015 with the GeoPass program that was focused on career relevant geoscience experiences. And um, we started another program in 2016 that was supporting leadership development for faculty who were engaged in DEI efforts. We um, have more recently focused on institutional transformation and on converting, really focused on research ecosystems. So are the um, environments where the students are working and learning inclusive? And you can see the transition from recruitment uh, to recruitment and retention and, and finally institutional change and um, uh, uh, environment. So we are evolving. These programs are evolving uh, over time. And then we hope that the committee will take a look at some of the programs that we've supported and identify some of the promising practices that have been developed. And if, um, if there are promising practices that we should continue to do in the future, we hope that this report might have some recommendations for us on how to move forward. And to that end, uh, the next slide, please. Um, we have issued a Dear Colleague letter that is a request for information on future develop directions in geosciences. This is for the GeoPass program. We paused the GeoPass program for this year, and we're thinking about revising the solicitation, and we're seeking advice from the community. So this request for information has a link to a survey. The survey has five questions, and we hope that you might uh, provide answers to all five, but if you just wanna answer one, that's fine too. Uh, any advice that you have for us would be very welcome, and the deadline for providing that advice is June 7th. I also want to highlight one new program that we uh, just issued a solicitation for about a week ago. This is called Forecast. It's a focus on recruiting emerging climate and adaptation scientists and transformers. The goal is to create student-centered programs at emerging research institutions that will prepare our students to enter our work environment and conduct, conduct community and partner-engaged science needed to address climate change. There are two tracks. One is a, a hub. There'll be one award for the hub and the, the hub will be recruiting students nationally from um, underrepresented groups and from emerging research institutions. And those rising seniors uh, will be given, uh, provided with professional development for a year and then uh, will have the opportunity to, to continue with the their studies with a fellowship for two years after, <clears throat> after graduation. And the track two will be awards to support fellowships for cohorts of students at emerging research institutions. That's our two institutions. And um, those students will be engaged in climate-related research, 
that it supports community resilience and works collaboratively with community organizations. And I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to Jim for any comments that uh, you, you might wanna. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Hey. Um, I'll just add a, a couple of comments. Um, so Lisa spoke very much at the, the directorate level, but Lisa's also done a great deal within the Division of Ocean Sciences. And some of you may know Lisa's uh, historical work within our REU program um, that has seen a steady increase in the diversity of student cohorts over the last decade. Um, so this is a, a long-term running program that's, that's had a lot of impacts throughout our community. In addition, the, the division has a postdoc program that uh, was reinitiated, I think would be the right way to put it, Lisa, uh, two, three years ago, um, and has already shown a great deal of attraction to the community. Um, this requires, this program requires broadening participation as a broader impact uh, in, in the proposal, in the solicitation. And it's combined with the AGU landing postdoc program for training in DEI and the STEM Cs program that supports diverse cohorts of students during transits in collaboration with RISE. So those are sort of the three efforts that we have uh, inside the, the division that are, uh, some of them are longstanding and some of them have either been reinstituted or new. And so, we are looking to you for wisdom. Uh, we need your, your input and your wisdom for how we can really change the way that uh, participation happens in the ocean science enterprise. And, and it's not just about NSF. It's, as you know, it's, it's multi-agency, multi-sectorial. And uh, your wisdom, uh, I wanna thank you in advance for your work on this. And uh, we look forward to getting your thoughts. So with that, I'll sort of open it up for any quick questions for Lisa or I. Um, Lisa? Okay. Thank you so much, Jim and Lisa. Um, does anyone have any questions? George. Hi, Lisa, Jim. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for helping to sponsor this study. Uh, I think it's a well overdue study, so I'm really looking forward to this. Well, Lisa, you mentioned a number of different programs uh, that, that have been run in the past and are still running, and, and the fact that you hope that we could take some lessons learned from that and share it with the greater community, which I think is a great idea. The hard part for me is hoping that you will be able to help us out identify some of the programs within those, some of the projects within those that you feel were successful so that we could reach out to the PIs and ask them questions about what they thought worked. And also maybe some projects that didn't work out as well because we're also interested in barriers, things that kept projects from being successful. And I know you funded quite a few programs and it would take a lot of work to try to figure out which PIs to contact. And so I'm, I'm kind of hoping you might be able to help us out with that. I will certainly, uh, yes, we can do that. I will go back to our team and ask for some advice because you're right, there are many, many projects that we've supported over the years. And I see faces on this call that uh, have been supported by uh, these programs. Um, so thank you for that question. And I, can I get back to you? <laughs> okay, great. I, I'll be happy to send uh, some ideas uh, in, later. All right, Corey and then Nikki. Hey, Lisa. Uh, yeah, thanks for going that overview. I was wondering, you know, I think when we do a lot of these programs, we kind of tend to focus a lot on the student programs. I think we've talked about this before, you know, the ecosystem shift. And, you know, the example I want to give us some of those NOAA programs where, 
you know, they have those, those EPP MSI programs where the long-term goal is to diversify the workforce and there's direct linkages in, into NOAA's workforce. Like, where do you see NSF's role though in kind of trying to sort of create diversity though within, you know, academia, I guess for lack of a better sort of description there where, you know, one of the big barriers, because you're talking about the emerging research institutions, which is great, but you don't see a lot of diversity in the R1s. Right. And there's there's some barrier there. And, you know, we have all these REU programs, you know, we have geopath, and, but we we don't see those students winding up as faculty at like an Ivy League oftentimes or, you know, a UC campus, you know, and some of them go back to MSIs like I did because, you know, there's a mission statement with those institutions that resonate with things we want to do. But there's also this kind of unspoken reality that there's this invisible barrier at some of these larger R1s that aren't allowing some of these students, you know, to enter that particular workforce. And so where do you see NSF's role in helping to change, change up some of that? Jim, do you want to take that or? Um, sure. So where's NSF's role? Um, in a nebulous way, um, so, so we, we can't really direct institutions, hiring practices at institutions. I, I know you know that. Um, but I do think the way that, that NSF and across the agencies, quite frankly, in, in the federal family is broadening the opportunities for folks at different places um, with a variety of backgrounds will have an effect, well, I don't know this, but I suspect we'll have a, a lasting impact on what our broader workforce looks like. And let me be a little more specific. So the, a, a lot of the folks, the, the, the architecture, if you will, of our funding enterprise has been and, and, and still is, heavily geared toward the R1 institutions and the basic research institutions. Um, so what NSF can do is work on opportunities to try and, and, and Corey, you mentioned uh, non-R1 institutions, right? So emerging research institutions, non-R1 institutions are the, the Geo Embrace program, for example, is a program that is, it, it's motivated to bring people to the, or make opportunities for people to come to NSF um, that, that have not historically had the, those opportunities. And some of it is because um, the jobs are different. So there's, the, at, at a lot of the R1s, the teaching loads are particularly light. So that, that creates a dynamic where those, institutions have opportunities that that folks at emerging research institutions or our twos, et cetera, may not necessarily have. And so with the Embrace program, and um, Lisa, feel free to, to sort of chime in on that. The, the goal is, is for us to think about new ways of diversifying the workforce everywhere and so that that will lead to um, different opportunities at traditionally um, at, at institutions that may traditionally have barriers. Um, so that sort of a little bit nebulous, but but our efforts from the federal side are trying to get as many folks into the the, the research enterprises as, as we can, recognizing that it's been very focused really in the R1 space. Lisa, I don't know if I... Yeah, I would also add that a lot of our major research programs are starting to integrate community uh, connection and uh, broadening participation into the requirements for those programs. For instance, navigating the new Arctic was a decade of effort at integrating uh, Arctic science and uh, the more traditional knowledge in the Arctic. 
Um, and we have a new, just funded a science and technology center called Braided that is attempting to uh, integrate Western science and indigenous knowledge. So we are working toward integrating broadening participation and community service and more practical um, society driven efforts into our basic research. Yeah, thank you. Um, Nikki and then Paul. Hi, thank you so much. This has been really informative and, and just to tag on to what other folks said, thank you so much for sponsoring um, this, this committee. My question was around, and I, I, I don't know that there's a direct answer, but maybe there is, but what does success actually look like? Because, um, you know, the, these programs have been going on for a long time. And I realize that the end goal is always shifting and expectations are always shifting. But I'm just sort of curious from your perspective, from a federal lens at NSF, what, what does success look like? I'll take a, a first stab at that. And thank you for the question, Nikki. It's, it's by implication that we're having this conversation, we don't think we've reached success. <laughs> That's sort of a, a backwards way of acknowledging that we know we're not there. Uh, what does success look like? Success from a... I want to, so I'm trying to speak both for myself, the division director and the federal family all at once. <laughs> uh, success looks like we have an enterprise that, that covers the breadth of diversity that our nation has. You know, if we're not there today. And so what we really like to see in the geosciences is represent thought representation from across um, from across our population, uh, quite honestly. And and we are not there today. Um, I don't know if that's too terse an answer, Nikki, but um, it that the short answer is that's what I think success looks like. No, that that's helpful. I think, I mean, I. Again, like I said, I think it wasn't, there's not necessarily one answer to that, but it's something, at least personally, I struggle with, and I think institutions struggle with just because of the history and context of everything. So, um, and so the other kind of piggybacking on that, is there a, a timeline to NSF of like, we wanna meet something by this time? I realize that's probably hard given shifting things but you know yeah it's just it's one of those things where i'm like how do we how do we yeah is there is there an end <laughs> is there is there a, a timeline um I'm trying to figure out exactly how to say what I'm thinking. <laughs> so uh, as quickly as possible, uh, that's, that's, that's not a helpful answer. So what I'd say is uh, my gray hair mostly marks time. And so I've been doing this for a while and we've been slow to move the needle on what I'd say is inclusion in the, the, the research enterprise, the, the, the federal research enterprise. Um, what I think this committee do, can do and the fact that we are constantly, we're constantly trying things that some of which are not working very well is we need to figure out how to bring um, the things we've tried, some of them have worked, but some of them have not transformed, if you will, the, the, the geosciences in a way that we had hoped. So when, as quickly as we can, 
I don't think, so this is dangerously close to personal philosophy. I don't think our work is ever done. And so I, I do think this is a, a purposeful, thoughtful, long-term endeavor. And I think we've gotten maybe some things right and maybe a lot of things that not have not been as effective as we would like. Um, and we still need thought leaders to help us get to where we want to be. Um, that sounded slightly platitudish, Nikki, sorry for that. Thank you so much, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We've got Paul and then George, and then we'll let you go. <laughs> I, um, so my question, revolves around data because understanding what works and what doesn't work, um, you, know, you need to have data to look at long-term outcomes, particularly when you're starting to look at uh, programs that support students and, and you know, whether it's undergraduate, graduate students, postdocs, people progressing through um, the, the pipeline. And in submitting NSF grants, I've, you know, I've had to submit data management plans. I've had to submit mentoring plans. I've never had to submit a, you know, assessment plan or a you know, longitudinal assessment plan or anything like that, that would give us the kind of data that would let us know, you know, are there particular models of RU program or, you know, graduate training program that are more successful than others. And, and some of the programs do this on their own, but it's not necessarily an NSF mandate. And I know, or at least I, my understanding is that with students that go through REU programs, you know, while the PIs that run those programs provide information on, um, the students who've been in the program so that NSF can collect demographic data that's not collected in a way where it could be uh, easily merged with data from the National Clearinghouse to look at, you know, does participating in an NSF REU increase the likelihood that you go on to a, uh, a career in science? And so are there discussions on, you know, getting more of that data either at the institutional level or at the individual grant level. Um, so that's, that's my question. I, I can take this one. Uh, yes, uh, in fact, we have created a new program uh, at NSF called the ETAP, Educational Traineeships and Policy or Partnerships. Um, but it's an effort to have sort of a, a common application system for all of our programs, particularly the REU programs uh, or any student-centered programs that are uh, supported by NSF. And so the students will come into the common app, the ETAP system, enter their information. And when they are selected, uh, that information, the PIs, have access to that information as well. It's um, uh, they have they have um, all all their application materials are in ETAP, and so we will be able to have a better idea of who's applying and who's getting selected, and hopefully we will connect uh, eventually the data in the ETAP system with our data on PIs and our data on. Um, uh, the future workforce, um, possibly through our uh, the EI, um, I'm blanking on the system, the, the data that we collect normally for the science enterprise. Um, so anyway, we are working on this and it's just coming online. So you might not have heard about it, but um, this coming year, all the ocean sciences are are required to use the ETAP system for their applications. So we've made that change and uh, it will start generating data for us in the future. Thanks for that question. 
Great. Um, now, now, now I actually know why I've been writing letters of recommendation to ETAP. I had no idea what that actually was um, or why they had so many different kinds of focus programs. So um, that's that's useful for me. Um, with, with ETAP, is, does that actually collect social security numbers as well so that it can go into National Clearinghouse? Because I, I think just like, like things like name and birthday, I think are insufficient for doing National Clearinghouse data and looking at, um, you know, progression through uh, graduate school and things like that. I don't know, but I would doubt that we are collecting social security numbers. I don't think we even do that for our uh, PIs anymore. Yeah, I mean, it, it might be worth exploring if there are maybe there are ways to do it without social security number, but it, it would be, I think, you know, really helpful in terms of getting the data to look at the long-term impacts of, of programs to, to figure out how to uh, create a link between what's in ETAP and what's in the, the National Student Clearinghouse so that, um, you know, we, we can start to make those linkages and figure out, um, you know, what's most effective, what's not particularly effective and um, use that to guide policy going forward. I will find out, but I, I suspect we are legally not allowed to do that. Thank you. For you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Uh, George, you've got the last question. Hooray, the first and last. So I, I had another question that I'm not sure if NSF or any other federal agency is legally allowed to do, um, but I thought I would ask. To, over 20 years ago, we worked with uh, Mexican authorities to get a permit to do research in Mexican waters. Part of that permit requirement was that we were required to work with local researchers, um, which I thought was a fabulous idea. It, it means that it's not US researchers going to an area and sort of doing the parachute science that we've heard about. And I didn't know if that was possible to do within the US uh, or uh, because we do have researchers going to all other parts of the US, sometimes in states that they don't live or, region or countries they don't live in and doing science and then going back home to their home institutions. And there are likely, I'm sure there are local researchers who would love to be able to be involved in that type of research, but have been unable to get federal funding to do that type of research. Um, so my colleague, Lisa Clow is also on the call and there I don't know if, if she is able to jump in on that one at all, but um, mostly that she has some particular experience in this space. Lisa, if not, I'm happy to take a... Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, great session. I'm lurking and every once in a while I'll come off a uh, camera, off of a video. Um, George, you, everything's uh, sort of run by Department of State for Ocean Sciences for uh, work within the US EEZ. I'm, I'm pretty sure you know that. There is a group of us that they do consult with uh, on sort of when, when uh, vessels are coming in. Um, I will say that uh, the U.S. is probably more hands off in most cases, right? Like we, we will um, sort of say no or put some restrictions on uh, occasionally. And, and uh, honestly, in the Arctic, we might do it more so than, than other places. Um, so, so there's that piece. Um, but I, I will mention, I, I know you guys were chatting a, a fair amount about indigenous, right? We were also, you know, there, there are non, uh, United States tribal nations within the U S so that this is very much a, a burgeoning, uh, area of interest. Um, and I, I will finish with, it's also changing globally. Uh, I don't know if anyone on the 
Paul right now has tried to work in the Bahamas, uh, but the Bahamas is declaring data sovereignty over anything collected within uh, the Bahamas. So it's uh, a world where I, it would be great if you guys sort of, you know, delve into some thoughts on this. Uh, I think we want to do the right thing for science, but we certainly want to do the right thing for people. And uh, I think there is some um, there, there's good interagency cooperation going on in, in these sorts of areas. So I think there is room to have a, a thoughtful conversation and consideration. So there's a, a, a kind of a high level, uh, yeah, not really, but um, maybe. So uh, things are things are changing. Thank you very much. And thank you again for your sponsorship of the study. <laughs> thanks so much for joining us today thanks so much for sponsoring and being on board with this committee um, i think uh, we all understand uh, nsf's expectations and some of the programs that, that you've been running since 2001 so thanks for sharing that and um, we're all on board to create a strategy to you know move that needle forward so um, if you think of other things, any, any other resources you want to share with the committee, of course, reach out. Um, and just thanks again for joining us. Um, I think this has been really informative um, and we really appreciate your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank and you. for everyone on the line, um, we are ending the, the public session for right now. Um, we'll be on hiatus until 1 p.m. Pacific, um, where we'll start our narratives workshop. So um, please join us again um, in an hour and a half. Um, until then, we are logging off. Thank you. Bye. All right, everyone. Um, welcome back. Um, it is um, my honor and privilege to, to um, introduce our next speaker. Um, we've got Kendall Moore with the University of Rhode Island. Um, she's a professor in journalism there and an award-winning documentary filmmaker. I don't know if you've seen any of her materials, but um, I've, I had the pleasure of um, watching a few seminars that she's given, and I'm really excited to see um, what she does for us today uh, in our workshop on narratives, on developing narratives. Um, I think we're still kind of getting logged in and then we'll begin in, in just a second. Um, thanks so much for joining us, Kendall. Yeah, go for it. Okay, can everybody hear me? And can they hear me online? It is, yeah, I think it's on. I just wanted to check to make sure that folks online can hear me. Yes, we can. Thumbs yes. up. Okay, perfect. We're just pulling up the presentation now. Um, but yes, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thank you for inviting me to be here today. I am honored to share with you um, some thoughts and ideas and probably opinions around narrative and the importance of narrative in the work that we're doing to diversify um, ocean and marine science. So um, again, I'm a professor at the University of Rhode Island and I have a background in um, reporting, but very specifically on scientific and environmental issues at the intersection of racism, race, anti-blackness, anti-indigeneity. And so I'm very passionate about this work and over the past few years have been able to um, produce a couple of films that have become operationalized in the marine and oceanographic spaces around diversity. So I'm really thrilled that we are starting to see a, a sea change around um, our efforts. So, um, I just want to share with you some objectives uh, regarding what hopefully we'll be able to uh, at least explore today. Um, I was asked to clarify the language around narrative. First of all, if we could just advance that slide for, for everybody. 
I'm going to explain what narrative actually means in various contexts. Um, we're going to spend some time exploring um, motivation and purpose and the use of narrative in this context. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about my own work and how I'm developing a better understanding around method, methodologies, and obstacles to collecting narratives. So um, if we advance to the next slide, just a little bit about narrative. I got this invitation to just talk about narrative. And um, as a filmmaker in my world, narrative means a lot, a lot of different things. So in uh, some spaces, narrative actually means fiction. So I don't typically do fiction. So I thought <laughs> I'm not the right person to come and talk about narrative because uh, I'm mostly a documentary filmmaker. So in some space, if you use the word narrative, just know that that's what the film community thinks you're talking about. Um, but today, I think what we're going to be exploring is narrative as a couple of different things. First of all, in this context, we talk about narrative as your, your internal story. Your internal story, who are you, right? How do you define yourself? How do you describe yourself? What animates you? What are the things that you care about? What is your identity? And then also, what is the narrative that you create for other people? And how does your narrative speak to other people's narratives? Because if you start to consider your narrative and other people's narratives, and we make space for one another's narratives, that's really, really important in, in scientific spaces because you see a systematic and historical erasure of narratives, but recently we're exploring how we expand that, right? The importance of personal narrative. Um, we're also talking about how narratives flow into and out of um, personal identity constructs. So what, how is, uh, how are narratives actually informed by your identity constructs, uh, your family, your culture, your religion, things like that? And then how does that uh, influence the way that you behave and you act in certain spaces? So um, the use of narrative in STEM, if we advance to the next slide, let's talk about why this is important. Now, this is a, a shortened version because this is literally, and I'll show you in a minute, this is a dissertation, but very briefly, um, we've become much more comfortable with this phrase, sense of belonging, right? I mean, maybe 10 years ago, perhaps, I don't think we were saying sense of belonging. I don't even know if, um, we would know what to do with that language if it landed in our laps. I mean, did people really even care about your sense of belonging? When I went to college in the 80s, I never heard that phrase. And now looking back, boy, I really would have enjoyed some sense of belonging. <laughs> so um, we're starting to learn about what, what sense of belonging is tied to and what it comes out of and flows into. So I talk about it in three different ways and on different levels. So in this conversation, I'm going to be talking about um, sense of belonging in you know, the individual. So at the self-awareness level, right? This is so important. Your self-awareness is critical. How many people are self-aware in the spaces that we navigate? Uh, how do we help people evolve into better self-awareness? Why does self-awareness even matter, right? It absolutely does matter because look, if you are a bull in a China shop and you have no idea that you're a bull and you're in a China shop <laughs> and everything's breaking, well, that's problematic, right? So a lack of self-awareness is problematic on so many different levels, but it doesn't have to be that way. We can do a, a lot of work uh, and put language and frameworks on it to, um, you know, do the work at the individual level, which then goes into the next level, which is at the in infrastructural level, the institutional level. How do we clear space for the development of self-awareness? Um, this is something that I'm learning a lot about. It inform informs the way that I do my filmmaking. It informs the way that I create my lab spaces. It's the way that I put my syllabi together. 
Um, so talking about infrastructure and institutional um, self-awareness development is, is a new but critical phase of our development. And then we have to start talking about more and more, why are we even needing to do this? So at the substructure level, so underneath all of this, why do we need to do more work about self-awareness uh, at the personal level and also at the institutional level? I mean, just basic, basic questions like who are you? Where do you come from? What do you care about and why? This isn't terribly difficult to do, and yet there's an absence, there's a lack of, of this very fundamental um, work that needs to be done. Okay, so in explicit ways of working towards sense of belonging, now, what does sense of belonging lead to? Well, it leads to better recruitment. It leads to um, better retention. We've learned this. There are some institutions where uh, sense of belonging is actually in some of your titles. You're doing diversity, equity, inclusion, and sense of belonging. That is who you are. And we know that what this means uh, and how it pays out is in recruitment and retention. So, um, what this looks like is institutions being able to see us, to listen to us, to hear us, and to support a multiplicity of narratives and identities, right? Um, perhaps an institution can see you, but maybe they're not listening, right? Or an institution can maybe listen, but don't hear. You have to do all of these things. These are all interconnected, okay? So I just want to say that there's a lot of research to support all of this, and all of you are experts in this, but as sort of like a little bit of a joke, I'm just going to say, okay, here's some, here's some resources. <laughs> you can't even, let's advance to the next slide. This runs off the page because as you know, there is now data to support that sense of belonging and the evolution of our identities, creating space for identities. We finally have literature to support the importance of this. There's no going back, correct? Right. So I'm just sort of skimming off the top because I know you all know this, but sometimes it just bears repeating, okay? And this is also just to create a context for the rest of the conversation, okay. This, the, some of these references are from a recent grant that we wrote, and I just thought, wow, that's so impressive. I'm so proud of our community for all the work that we've been able to do. Let's just put it up there very briefly. Okay, let's move. Yes, let's applaud ourselves. Okay, so moving on, what I do want to talk about, uh, if we advance to the next slide, I want to talk more specifically about how this translates into the type of work that I do as a communicator, as an artist, as a journalist, uh, filmmaker. I'm not alone and I am very, very proud of the fact that there are um, some really wonderful institutions doing this work. Now, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of examples just to show the types of things that are being done at the intersection of the use of narrative and personal narrative. Um, personal um, development and science communication also uh, anti-racism, anti-indigeneity work, uh, anti-blackness. A lot of this is intersecting through these organizations and the various types of um, uses of personal narrative. So um, again, the types of things that we're starting to see and getting supported finally with funding, documentaries, podcasting, photography, mixed media art, installation, short TV interviews, living documentaries, live performances. I would say 20 years ago, I've been doing this a long time. There was a time in the 90s where I was told, well, nobody cares about racism and we're certainly not going to fund documentaries about it. And now we're finally getting that support. And in the context of science and STEM, this is, a, this is a really significant moment. So I just want us to recognize that this conversation and the work that's happening is significant and powerful. So some of the groups that are doing uh, really powerful work, I wanna highlight. So um, lower left 
part of the screen, uh, my, my close friend, Sunshine Menezes, who is a colleague, dear friend at the University of Rhode Island, just recently stepped down as the executive director of the Metcalf Institute. Um, she is working with um, a professor at the University of Michigan on this project called the SciComm Identities Project. So you see pictures of the fellows there. And in, in the work that they're doing, so they're focusing on personal narrative and they're learning how to use podcasting as a way to, to weave together their personal stories, to, to work on the evolution of their identities and also talk about diversity in STEM. So if you're interested, I would check out that work. Um, some of you have heard of Black and Marine Science, uh, headed up by Tiara Moore. She's also um, going into that direction, working on, I work with her personally, and you'll see some clips later. Um, we're working on documentaries. Um, so Radna Tripathi at UCLA, the top of the screen, CDLS, Center for Diverse Leadership in Science, has been doing a lot of this um, identity work uh, for years, just absolutely a, a groundbreaker in, in this domain. Um, upper right-hand corner is Ciencia PR. So this is Monica Mujer's work. Uh, she's coming out with a documentary today, this afternoon. So I would recommend uh, checking out her new film, Coming Home, talking about STEM, STEM, her STEM identity um, as a Latina woman from Puerto Rico. Um, the organization Turk, um, focusing on um, uh, STEM identities in the indigenous community. And the work that they're doing there is uh, using photography. So a, a quick glimpse of coming home, because like I said, it premieres today. If we advance the slide, we can just watch a very brief snippet of Monica's film. I'm looking for passion fruit. There's often passion fruit that falls from the hill and I love passion fruit. <laughs> love passion fruit. When I was growing up, there was an elder in mi barrio, Don Franco. He milked my family's cow and harvested fruits and vegetables around my parents' house. I loved following him around. I always had a million questions. Why do chickens love earthworms? Why do plants grow at certain times of the year? Why, how could he predict when it was going to rain, even if there wasn't a cloud in the sky? Why, why, why? He hadn't finished elementary school, but he knew so much about nature. I didn't know it then, but Don Franco was the first scientist I ever met. there. I would love for folks to, to check out the film that premieres today. Um, let's advance to the next slide and uh, watch a little clip of from Turk on native STEM. What does success and persistence look like for Native Americans in STEM? Native STEM Portraits is a three-year project studying the barriers and supports for Native Americans in STEM. We are a group of researchers from Turk, the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, or ACES, and the University of Georgia. In 2021, our researchers surveyed 238 Native students and professionals in STEM. Two-thirds of the participants revealed that they majored in the STEM field to give back to Native communities. We identify that giving back is a key motivator for their success and persistence in STEM. In later interviews, 
42 participants shared their photos representing their STEM experiences. This practice is called photo elicitation. Through their photos, our Native participants described their joy in teaching, mentoring, and outreach as part of giving back to their community. Meadow, a microbiology graduate student, is studying illnesses affecting the Native population. This is her way of giving back. When I would look at my community and how I wanted to give back to it, that was a really big motivator for me. I went to my first ACES conference in September, and that was a really big thing that helped me gain back my motivation to do what I'm doing because seeing so many indigenous scientists and seeing people doing science that was focused around indigenous populations really helped motivate me to keep going and doing what I'm doing. Attending the ACES conference reinforced Meadows' motivation to continue her studies. Nellie, who works in engineering, talked about how he gives back through a workplace outreach committee. Where I work at, I support our American Indian Outreach Committee and we support STEM. We support Native professionals who go out to our local schools and judge science projects and help them. And whatever that kind of function as far as science and math functions to support our local rural reservations, that's what we do. And so the professionals that work, I'm so thankful that they come out and support us. So that's a good support system too where I work at. That same committee also serves as an important support system for Nelly. We recommend that educational institutions and employers offer Native students and employees more opportunities to give back to Native communities. These opportunities can be credit-bearing internships, service learning courses, or outreach programs. After all, giving back is a critical motivator for Native STEM students and professionals to persist in STEM. Wonderful. So I want you to put a pin in purpose and motivation. Okay, so I want us to become um, committed to further understanding this concept, but also in watching that clip, thinking about how there is a shift in the ethos behind why we do research, right? So for these students, it's about giving back to your community, which is not part of the bedrock of Western science. It is not what drives Western science. So I just wanna put a pin in that because we're gonna come back to that conversation. Okay, so let's move on. Another example is what does um, actually some of the work that, that I've been doing recently. Um, I've been working with my colleagues at um, the Interspace Center at the Graduate School for Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island where I'm situated. And we've been exploring this idea of what does it look like when you're actually making a documentary in real time in one confined space, right? Which means that it's participatory because it's under the influence of the people in the room at the time. So it's a, a breathing uh, organism of an experience, right? So I've been making documentaries for a long time and you just sort of fling it into the world via film festivals and television. But in this situation, you're creating it with the storytellers before our very eyes. So um, the first time we did it was a, a, a really powerful experience. And I'm smiling because Amelia Moore was, was part of the, the first group that was willing to be part of the experiment. And maybe she can share some of her thoughts about her experience doing it. But this first one was called Oceans Tell Stories Through People. And we identified four individuals who would be willing to share their personal stories, their personal narratives. And what we did was we had them tell their stories in real time and we just sort of wove them together and projected on the walls were visuals that accompanied their stories. And it was on the ceilings and on the, you know, the side walls and the floor. And uh, there was live music also. So it was a really immersive, kind of experience that we were going for. And the individuals that we wanted to work with um, come from diverse backgrounds. Um, an in, in individual from the local Narragansett tribe was part of the storytelling group. Um, like I said, Amelia was there telling her story. Um, one of my colleagues at the University of Rhode Island, Melva Trevino-Pena, uh, she's a beautiful woman who, um, please look her up. Uh, I just adore her. She does work on fisheries and other things. She does uh, what we call Latinx geographies. Um, so, 
anyway, this was a really powerful experience, but a little rough because this was, we've done this now three times, but I'm going to share this um, with you all, um, knowing that this is the first time we did it. Our most recent iteration was we actually opened Ocean Sciences meeting. So it went from this small thing at the University of Rhode Island to this massive um, conference opener in, in a pretty short amount of time. But let's, let's just share a, a short clip. Welcome to Oceans Tell Stories Through the People. One of the most healing and empowering things any of us can do in this life is to tell our stories. To tell our stories with all of the joy, the exhilaration, the beginnings, the uncertainty, the unfamiliar, the challenges in front of us, the middle, the death, grief, longing, vulnerability, and transformation and acceptance, or lack thereof, endings. The craft of storytelling is one of practice. So too is the craft of listening to someone's story. It is one of the greatest gifts we can give to really hear and be present with someone's story, to resonate with them in their own experiences, from their own identities, expanding our sense of what makes sense and what does not in the world. Each name on the slide in front of you has contributed something meaningful to this experience, from projections, video content, artwork, research, and these ethereal and immersive sounds that were being composed live. On their own, these pieces are beautiful, thought-provoking, but when they come together, they become part of a larger story. This evening, we hear stories from our storytellers that have worked hard to craft them from their center of their own experiences. But we ask you not only to hear these stories, but to open the ears of your heart to feel these stories. And do not shy away from any feelings, thoughts, emotions that may come up. Pay attention. Allow this experience to wash over you. Journalist Barry Lopez, who spent an entire lifetime embedding himself with various scientific teams and projects all to tell a very human experience-centered story, presents an appropriate quote for this evening. The storyteller's job is to create a situation for wisdom to reveal itself. I love that quote. Our job as organizers has been to create a situation for wisdom to reveal itself, both for the storyteller and for the story listeners. Natasha Wies, Wanda Hall. Okay. So um, what we're learning is that it's okay to center your personal narrative now. We're being empowered, I think, to create space. And now in some spaces, you're actually being expected to reveal yourself. So other things that we're learning, if we advance the slide, I want to talk about what I've welcome to I think uh, what I am learning and have learned um, for a long time I thought that there was no interest in identity in STEM and I would say that a lot I would just say there's just no interest in in who we are but what I realized after working on one of my current documentaries also with Amelia around decolonizing science is there wasn't a lack of interest in identities, even if you just start, if you study um, the Linnaean, you know, history of, of taxonomy and look at the names of things, look at who was naming, right? Who was naming these things and what are they named? That is identity work. That is claiming, right? So it has always been um, explicit that uh, there was an interest in identity in STEM. It was just that there was no interest in our identities in STEM, right? And there was an active erasure of our contributions, our uh, philosophies, our concerns, our commitments, our, our ethos, our, way, our philosophies. So I just want to correct that for the record that there is an interest in identity. It's just that there isn't a lack. Uh, there is a lack of interest in our identities. Um, I also wanna talk about, again, motivation and purpose and how it is very much so tied to identity. We don't talk about motivation and purpose in ways that we need to be talking about in STEM. We really need to think about 
from a cultural perspective, there are certain things that um, based on your ancestry, for example, you are encouraged to care about, encouraged to do. Certain things are culturally driven. They are just part of your DNA by virtue of the culture that you come from. You cannot separate those things. Motivation in our communities for communities of color is not typically money, and it is certainly not competition. And you saw in that video about um, you know, doing work in indigenous spaces, it's about giving back. So we really do need to be thinking about motivation and purpose and develop some language around um, the, the connection between these in relation to our, our communities, our identities. Um, we also need to be talking about relationships more. This language is becoming much more prominent. So motivation and purpose as tied to relationships because for us, folks, people of color, again, we're working relationally. I think we weren't really talking about this in such explicit terms, but now we're really starting to develop frameworks around how do you um, work relationally in indigenous communities for sure, um, but in Latino and Latinx and Latina communities and black communities, we're starting to develop better frameworks. And it's definitely informed, I think, by the work that's being done in indigenous spaces around um, you know, STEM related endeavors. So relational practices are becoming increasingly relevant in STEM practices. And I know this because I recently talked to a program officer at NSF who said, I have to say that the language that you're providing is really, really helpful because we are certainly seeing a pivot in this direction. So I really want people to underscore this point that relational practices are becoming increasingly relevant in STEM practices. Okay. Now, one of the best expressions of identity and relationships is through narratives using various modalities. And the point is, is that when we see these things, when we hear these stories, we start to believe them. So if there's an absence of narrative, an absence of these things, we don't believe them. There are so many kids that, and maybe you were one of these kids, who just didn't think that you could do that thing because you just didn't see it, right? So this is a really important point about um, creating more space and providing more resources um, for narratives in STEM spaces. So seeing is believing. It's not um, hearing about it or it was written about in a text. It's actually about seeing it, okay? All right, now I wanna pause for a second for any questions uh, or points of clarification that I can provide because I'm about to pivot in another direction. Any questions or comments so far? Okay, so now I wanna move on and I wanna talk about purpose and motivation a little bit more because I think that we need to explore what is part of the substructure of the narrative. Right, so purpose and motivation. If we advance to the next slide, to do narrative work, and now I'm gonna say, for you to do your narrative work, you must be aware of your own motivations. Do you know what motivates you? And also, we must understand the implication of those on the people and communities you engage with. So your motivation, whatever you're motivated to do, and the purpose behind your work, do you think about how that has an impact on those that you're working with? So this is going back to self-awareness, right? You all know that one person who is not self-aware. <laughs> So it's important for us, foot soldiers, we're laughing, but it's really not funny. Um, <laughs> if you're not endowed with a knowledge or framework or understanding of this, then how are we supposed to teach other people, right? So in my lab, the studio lab, we are working on developing language around social emotional learning, we call it. So 
understanding our social and emotional purpose and motivation, and also developing language around how to work ethically, which means that everybody is given space to divine their terms and you honor them throughout the process and beyond, okay? So this is also becoming increasingly important. So at this point, I wanna do an exercise with everyone and we're probably gonna have to pause a little bit because we're gonna do this in the room. So we'll take a, a 15 minute break for the folks online and then we will come back and uh, we'll, we'll share once we come back. Is that okay? Okay, yeah, that works. Okay. And, and also trying to understand that this isn't a common occurrence in STEM spaces. And we're trying to normalize that, right? There have been so many, as a journalist working in STEM, it's so awkward for me because I'm just inherently curious. My mother would have called it nosy about people's lived experiences. It's like, I can't even interact with you without knowing your story almost, right? I wanna know. But I've told, been told many times, don't ask don't ask and it doesn't matter. But for me, it does matter because it establishes the terms by which I interact with you, right? So I would never want to harm anybody. I wouldn't want to, not, not, not that I would, but with more information, it's and information that is legible around your identity makes things easier for us to connect, right? So why hide that? It's an opportunity. So this isn't this isn't common though. And I, you know, over the years it's been challenging for me because that is absolutely how I am built. So that's me <laughs> on the right side of the screen. And just very briefly, um, the purpose around my work in my filmmaking is about raising awareness about scientific and environmental issues in communities of color, specifically in black, black. Um, African American and Black Indigenous communities. Um, but the motivation I've learned um, over the years is that it's very much so tied to my ancestry. I feel an obligation to the generations of people that came before me. And, and I always get choked up when I share this, but I'm going to do it. These are my ancestors. If we advance the slide, I'm a seventh generation descendant of slaves. On the left side of the screen, that's Nancy. She was a slave in Missouri, okay? Um, on the right side is um, my ancestor who became a freed black woman in um, Pennsylvania. And above that, the Weaver family, yes, those are my ancestors. On the right side of the screen, that's my great, 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 great grandfather and his wife. Those are my people. And when I look at that picture, I say, that's my motivation. <laughs> And that's why I'm, I'm committed to protecting them because there was active erasure of our people. And that's why I do the work that I do, right? So I'm very now cognitive of that. I'm very aware. A lot of you have a similar kind of motivation, right? This isn't unusual. I get choked up, sorry. <laughs> but if we move on and talk about your first story, I just want to, we can advance the slide. I want to see if somebody, now that I've given you an example, I would love to hear somebody share theirs. Does every, anybody have a five-year-old story they want to share? Kiki? My purpose from five to 10 was to read the big kid books. And my motivation for that was at some point, like, I don't know, first or second grade, they started saying, oh, we're worried about Kiki and she's not reading at level and having these parent teacher conferences and all this. And in third grade, my teacher, Mrs. Johnson, introduced the concept of a book report. And she said, you could go and take whatever book you want and write a book report. And I suddenly wasn't bound by like my level or those shelves. And I could go anywhere in that library. And I picked the book Scruffy and I wrote about Scruffy the dog. And it was this sense of liberation. That I, was, I was in control of my education for this one activity. 
And after that, I was like, I can read all these books. It was just, I was bored of reading Jane and Dick go to the well or whatever that I was given before. And I remember looking at the fattest book I could find in the library. It was Farmer Boy. It was one of Laura Ingalls Ingr Wilder books. And I was like, I'm gonna read that big fat book. So it was freedom. It was freedom in my own education and having autonomy and not being told what my level was. That was what motivated me. I love that. Powerful. So would anybody else like to comment on her story? Thoughts? Or would somebody like to share their story? Let's do another one. Five years old. Um, so mine was actually somewhere I, I put two. One is was reading books and the other one being playground baseball. Um, and during recess, all my friends would play baseball and then we would get home and we would go play baseball. Um, and I, I, like still on the weekends, I play baseball. Um, but I, I, I think of the two together um, and I thought reading and playing baseball were fun. I, they were like really great. And I, the, and the, I think sometimes people think sports and uh, learning are completely different, but I thought of them as both fun and both the same thing. Um, and I, I think I'm still like that. I still think of science and learning as I actually enjoy it, um, but I also like baseball, um, <laughs> but also like other sports and, and things that are often not considered to be, video games being one, you know, just like things that are not considered to be intellectual. I still find those, I find those fun as well. Great. So uh, Xavier, uh, Javier has his hand up. Oh, perfect. I can't see. Yeah, no, I just want to follow up because I see a connection also from five to 10 and baseball. I mean, in elementary school, I really like to or hang out with all my friends. Like all my friends want to, I wanted everybody to be, to be together. So I came up with the name of the ants and all our group was called the ants. And so that we could play baseball or football, or we always had to do things together. And so the idea was that, you know, working together, we could do anything. We could beat the powerful. We could, you know, it was cooperation versus competition. And that was a strong motivator. <laughs> Five, six, whatever. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So all of you looking at your five-year-old self, do you see a connective thread in the work that you do today? Yes? Okay. Who wants to give us that? Connection between your five-year-old self. Give us an example of how your experience as a five-year-old manifests in who you are today. So my... A lot of my thread is learning, so like like reading, but my motivations as a kid were to be a good student. So I'm realizing that a lot of my mo uh, motivations before 20 were other people's expectations of me. So being a good student, being um, independent in college, I had a, an event with my family, um, just a, a bunch of deaths and losses within a one month period of my freshman year in college. So I went through college thinking I can't ask for help because, you know, my dad lost his job, everybody's stressed out. And so it was being a good student and then also not asking for anything. But what's interesting it, with my purpose now to learn about others and to also learn about myself, I cannot tell if my motivations are reverse engineered through how I now view my five-year-old self, my 10-year-old self, my 20-year-old self, like doing the work that I do now with learning about other people, but then also the internal work to understand why I am the way that I am. So I can't, I don't know if I can separate them and I, you know, through this lens or not. That makes sense. Yeah. You might not know, or it might not even matter at some point. Yeah. Yeah. That was really good though. Most of us see the connection easily, or maybe you just have to dig a little bit, but it's definitely there. And if it's way buried, there's a reason for that. 
and it is worth trying to unearth it. And I know that it's probably traumatic for those of us who don't want to unearth it, but a lot of healing, there's an opportunity there for that, for sure. Right. So the point here also is that we shouldn't be afraid of our own personal narratives. We need to give ourselves grace. We need to create space for that. We need to have an interaction with our younger selves, our inner children, right? They're still there. They're still at play. They're still operating at a certain level, whether you're cognitive or aware of it, they're still there, right? So we want to give them attention because once we're able to do that, acknowledge that, we're able to do that for other people. Folks come into your spaces and they want to be embraced. They want to be seen. They want to be heard. So if you're afraid of your inner self, you're not going to be all that interested in hearing other people's inner selves, right? So you have to do the work on you first so that you can do that work for other people as hard as that is, okay? And so what we're doing is developing an appreciation. Let's advance the slide for something called, and I, and I started the conversation with this, and this is doing the, the social emotional learning and teaching and working. So social emotional learning. Now, don't see. It's a phantom Zoom issue, George. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. So what we're doing is we're understanding what this looks like. So it's not just a definition on paper, but you're starting to see how it works, okay? And the point of it is to develop the skills and abilities that promote positive attitudes about your story and you and vis-a-vis -vis other people's. Your ability to build healthy relationships really only comes if you're healthy yourself, right? So again, it's about addressing your own internal story and issues, et cetera. And based on that, making responsible decisions. So this is a lot of work <laughs> that is required to be able to show up and act responsibly and being able to be held accountable, especially when wrongdoing has occurred. So that's, that's why it's so important to develop self-awareness in these spaces because none of us wants to do harm. We want to do good work. We want to support people. We want to nurture people. So this is vitally important. So a couple more, um, comments about this and we'll move on and I'm going to show you some other examples. So if we advance the slide again, I just want to show you that so social emotional teaching and learning in the context of purpose and motivation driven work. So these are interrelated and you're starting to see the interaction, the interplay through these exercises that we've just done. So moving on to the next slide, just a couple more examples here, examples of social emotional learning and how it manifests in the work. And this is a short list. Um, individual relationships are considered now and how you do relation in doing the work. Now, 20 years ago, nobody cared. Nobody was talking about my relationship with my students in the lab. It was just a bunch of people who worked for you and maybe you knew their names, right? Um, group dynamics influence decisions um, and decision making. So now you're considering people's identities and how you're making decisions, how you're asking questions, the questions you're even asking. So if you're in a very diverse lab space, now people, you know, the PI is now probably going to be more compelled to say, you might have a very specific cultural or, you know, community-based interest and you want to go back to your community and do your work. I'm doing work over here, but I will consider working around what you're interested in. I know you're in my lab because I had funding for you over here to do the work that I'm doing in Antarctica, but you want to do work in Mexico. Let's talk about that. But I need, I need to learn some things to be able to work with you in this space that I'm not familiar with, but 
I think it's not good for us to continue to avoid doing certain things because of a cultural barrier, especially if we have diverse identities in our labs, in our research spaces. That's over, right? Certainly can't deny people because of that. Oh, I don't want, I don't want that in my lab because that's gonna sully my research agenda because I know they're gonna try to distract me from me studying this over here because they're gonna wanna do that over there. This happens, right? And you know what happens as a result? Those people leave STEM. There's no space for them, right? Another thing that's really important is that if you've done the work, you'll be able to be held accountable. Nobody enjoys being held accountable, but if you've done some work and you've matured, you probably have a better chance of being able to be held accountable. You're also operating within an ethical moral framework. So what motivates the work is now very, very different. Okay. Now this is some new language and I'm going to pause and check to make sure you know what I mean when I say ethical. What does that mean and how does that resonate for you? You're on the front lines of doing this work. How many of you are operationalizing the term ethical? I can't tell you how often I know you do because we work together. <laughs> but maybe I should pick on you because, yeah. How about you share with us what we've learned over the past four or five years growing into this new framework, because this is new for us too, right? So what is it starting to look like for you? I mean, it's definitely a sense of praxis. Like how does, how does what we learn or, you know, this um, social emotional learning, this historical context, the understanding of um, the needs of others, like those become, those become the center of the work as opposed to the professional hoops and the expectations of the career. Sometimes with a lot of tension thrown in, that's, it's, not a, it's not an easy fluid thing. Um, and relationship-centered um, work, um, mentorship networks, um, um, relating with our students in different ways. Um, relating with our peers in different ways, relating with the institutions in different ways. Again, not always fluid, not always easy, a lot of tension in that. Um, but, I, but as you say, um, when, when the motivation actually comes from the frameworks that you're building intentionally, the tension is easier to bear because you understand where it comes from. Mm -hmm. And so you, you understand it's a tension. You know, I've been doing all of this engaged work that doesn't produce publications at a particular kind of rate or publications in a particular uh, format or in a particular um, place, you know, like the kind of journal is less important um, than the appropriate, the propriety of getting the message to the right people in the right way. Um, and those tensions become easier to bear. It doesn't necessarily mean they become easier to, to navigate but I don't have that internal sense of anxiety um, or doubt about it. Um, and it's much more easy in a way to articulate and, and enlist and enroll other people in to engaging in the framework as well. Um, I think that's just some initial thoughts. That was good. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of those examples, but one of the big ones that we have learned is something called decentering, decentering yourself, clearing space, moving over, animating, elevating, supporting, nurturing others. What does that look like? Because in STEM, as you know, if you're not the first author, it doesn't matter. You're the fifth author. Are you, are you going to even get tenure with that? Right, so the competition, the need to be first, the one who pioneers, the one who discovers, it's a foreign concept to say, let me step aside and let this individual have this space and let me nurture them 
in this space and allow them to become who they need to become. And we have an interesting dynamic because I'm her mentor. And then we have Melva, who is her mentor. So we have, we have literally three generations of mentorship. All of you are mentors and you have generations of mentorship relationships. And that's what you're doing in those relationships. If you're doing it right, you're clearing space for them, right? To help them come into who they want to become. So decentering is such an important um, part of this process, but you really have to check your ego and science is an ego game. So there's just constant tension with doing the right thing, but how Western science, you know, defines success. They're antithetical, right? It's like ethics is not really, it's almost like a, an awkward bedfellow. It shouldn't even be in there. And I'm not talking about scientific ethics. I'm not talking about <laughs> like the standard IRB stuff. I'm talking about doing the right thing in human relationships. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. So decentering. Let's drop down to slide 21. And now I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that I've learned around um, collecting narratives. Because as a journalist, this has been an evolutionary process for me. And I think that it's analogous to uh, being scientific researchers because as journalists, I mean, I've been doing journalism since the late eighties and I was just trained to dive bomb into a situation and just extract what I needed and then get out. And it was a matter of, you don't even have time you have three hours to get that story. You go in, you take it, and it gets transmitted to the world. And do you know how violent that is? I mean, I've, I've worked in, you know, very challenged places around the world. And to go into an AIDS-affected community in East Africa and all your bureau wants is a couple of sound bites from people who are dying is a wretched existence. I mean, you really do just feel awful at the end of the day, but that is the standard practice. You just parachute in and you parachute out. And guess who else does that? Scientists. Really, I mean, the bedrock of Western science is to extract. And it's no longer acceptable because what happens after you've extracted? What happens to that community? The people involved? It's highly problematic. And so now we're sort of forced to confront the demons of the past, <laughs> right? We're the ones who are doing that. And literally you are the ones who are doing that. So I just want you to think of, you know, my work as very similar to the work that you're doing as scientists. So bear with me. Let's talk a little bit about the obstacles and working cross community. So one of the biggest obstacles really in most spaces and in most relationships is what? Trust. Earning trust is not easy. It takes time, it takes effort, it's nuanced. You might think that you've earned trust and in reality it's the opposite. Sometimes you have absolutely no idea what the dynamics are. So trust is, um, if we could advance the slide, one of the most important aspects of doing um, ethical research. And ethical research that leads to sustainable, um, sustainable practices. You've got fear, you've got anxiety, you've got suspicion, you've got a whole host of other things. But then you also have this, are you being authentic? I put quotes on that around that because I study I have a PhD in philosophy and I don't believe in authenticity. So that's just me though. I just don't think there's really such thing. I think that we operate mostly very performatively in professional spaces. So to become truly authentic is very, very challenging. So how do you break that down? How do you earn trust? How do you experience a certain degree of authenticity so that you can um, move forward in a relationship that is mutually satisfying and nurturing for everybody involved, okay? Does this resonate with most of you? You understand what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna pause and see if anybody 
can give me an example of when you had to build trust in your work. And that's for folks online too. So people are shy because they're now like second guessing themselves. Maybe I didn't really build trust. <laughs> that's okay. Go ahead, Kiki. Uh, so for my dissertation, I was studying bycatch, and particularly turtle scooter devices and dolphin bycatch, two of the most controversial um, fisheries issues we've had in this country. They were at the height of it. There were death threats. There were fractured relationships. And I was coming in now probably 20 years, 10 to 20 years after the fact, and wanting to dig this stuff up again that had not been properly dealt with. And I was learning as I was going. I was half trained by anthropologists and they just tossed their students in the deep end and say, if you're meant to do this, you'll swim. And I learned as I went what was happening. I learned that word of me coming was preceding me. People were literally calling each other and saying, there's this black woman coming around talking about pets. And that spread from North Carolina to Texas. But that wasn't a bad thing. Like it was actually good that word of me coming was ahead of me so that people could talk about what their experience was with me and they could mull over like, do I wanna interact with this woman? Cause she's probably gonna call me next. And that that was okay. And I ran into gatekeepers who for very good reasons were like, no, you can't talk to me. No, you can't talk to my community. And I would ask on occasion, some people I never got through, but what I recognized was giving people space and time, allowing them to say no, allowing them and, and saying, hey, feel free to talk about me and what your experience was and decide for yourself if this feels good for you. Um, and then showing that I would be frank with them and then showing that I would not share the things that they did not want to share recognizing that the guidebook on how you do human research is just a guidebook. And you have to go with what is actually giving people trust and security. And it's not just about checking boxes. Um, recognizing that when people show you something that's vulnerable, that's precious to them, that you are in that space with them. It reminds me, there's this Bible verse, mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. Even when it doesn't have anything to do with the topic at hand, like people had never, people had not come to talk to them to listen. And I had to listen to whole life stories and I would appreciate it. And they could see that I was appreciating it. Those are the ways that I learned how to build this trust and be authentic and share my story of recreational fishing, but not to be presumptuous to say, well, my little recreational fishing relates to your commercial fishing. It was just a, a little half a piece of a bridge that says, this is a little bit that reaches towards you and show me how this little bit of my lived experience might connect to yours. Like you show me how that might connect. That's what I learned. I don't know if I answered the question. I wandered, sorry. No, absolutely. That was great. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody want to comment on that or have a question? Okay. All right. Let's move on and talk a little bit more about these methods. So this, this work is actually philosophical. Um, it, it comes out of a lot of it is um, in philosophical spaces from primarily communities of color. Okay, it might not be called ethics, but it is ap absolutely ethics. It is philosophy, it's um, social emotional learning. But again, this language might not necessarily show up um, in those spaces, but that is what this is. So these are grounding philosophies now, okay? Um, the grounding practices that are part of ethical work in addition to centering and decentering is about co-creation, the co-creative process. Are you doing it together? Are you um, problematizing, which is 
how do you decide that something is even a problem? In some communities, something isn't necessarily a problem or even problematic. Imagine that as a scientist, you're like, this is definitely a problem. And then you go into the community and they're like, no problem here for whatever reason, right? So going into a community and bringing your assumptions based on your internal logic can be highly problematic. Trying to build trust when they haven't decided that something is an issue or worth questioning, who you have to get buy-in and then you have to co-create around the problematization. problemization. Otherwise it's gonna be rocky for you, okay? And it might really be jarring for you because you will go, but all of the lizards are dying. Everyone can see the dead lizards, but the community is like, no dead lizards here. So what do you do, right? So co-creation is absolutely necessary, which means that you have to align your logic with theirs because their logic matters the most <laughs> in that situation. Because if you're trying to go there and they're standing in front of there, you're not gonna be able to go there. It's as easy as that. And then the process along the way, once you've convinced everybody Everybody's convinced, not you convinced everybody. Everybody is convinced of something being a problem and you have problematized together, then you can proceed usually together. But you have to go through those first two stages in a co-creative kind of way. You can't go into a community you know, being presumptuous anymore. It's over. Or you shouldn't be doing that. In some spaces, maybe it's not over, but you should know that it is unacceptable. Accountability, well, that's that's the new thing now because there was a time where people just got away with everything and we don't even in some situations don't know how to hold people accountable. I work, work at an institution that I, I don't even, in a lot of instances, you know, things will be so obviously wrong and I'm like, I don't know how to hold these people accountable. I have no idea, right? That's what we need to be working on. And that also needs to be a co-creative process. And the only way you get there is by having honest conversations, okay? Which is another thing that's very challenging, but we'll talk more about that. Another grounding practice that we don't do enough is finding joy in all of this. I think self-evolution should be joyful. It shouldn't be painful. Co-creation should be joyful. It shouldn't be drudgery. Oh, I have to work with this community. Again, we have to problematize together. Ugh. No, if that's you, then get out. <laughs> Take your joyless self out of here. We don't want you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. Well, I want to share a couple of clips. I want to jump down to because I do want to spend more time having conversation. I want to jump down to slide 25. Do you need permission? Take a look at this. Can you play that? Okay. Um, can you just click on that and then I'll give you access? Oh, actually, I'll be able to give you access. Oh, did you send it? Okay. How is that going to make a difference? Oh.
Okay, so some of you know this film. I imagine most of you have seen it. Can We Talk, which we made in 2018, which looks at sense of belonging. And the participants in the film were brave enough to share their stories. And then we used this film in various spaces to get this conversation going. And then we made a second film and now we're working on our third film. So if you haven't seen it, I just wanna share a clip with you. Some folks on the call are actually in the film. Wendy is in the film. For those on the line, we're just trying to get the technology working. Thanks for your patience.
I don't know that the sciences will ever be more welcoming. But there's undeniable privilege that comes with, with being white. I don't, I haven't always felt um, included or embraced. I taught them to say they're an indigenous scientist. <sighs> Most of what I felt in STEM is just isolation, to be honest. I felt that there was always this um, assumption that I was dumb, that I was stupid or less than compared to like my um, classmates. I felt like I always had a chip on my shoulder, like there was something to prove. And I felt like when I came home, it was very different. Like at home, there wasn't this surprise that I was intelligent. It was more of like an expectation. I didn't really get um, praise much about it at home because it was just, this is what you're supposed to do. I remember having a college counselor and um, getting close to college application times um, and sharing with her that I wanted to go to medical school. Um, and I remember specifically saying to her, uh, mentioning one of the Ivy Leagues that I wanted to go to for medical school and being met with oh, you should never apply there because people like you don't get into those schools. So you should just um, decide to do something else. I think you need to uh, tailor your ambitions more towards this field or the other fields um, because my dreams, I guess, for her were a little too big. I was completely disarmed because I couldn't tell if she was accusing me of cheating on my exam or if she was trying to I don't know, or if she, I don't know what she was trying to do, but it made me feel terrible that she didn't, that it was, that it didn't occur to her that I would have been a good writer. It seems to me difficult not to find within 350 million inhabitants in this country, a person of color that can fill the same position given the same merits as, as any other body, any, anybody else. You have to surround yourself with good people who are going to champion you, who are going to mentor you, who are going to share information with you, the unwritten rules. You know, there's so much information that you may not get because minorities <clears throat> are not championed at the same rate at the same level as the majority. Resistance to change um, is, is the largest challenge that we have. I don't think there is a lack of, I don't think there's a lack of goodwill. But at the same time a person may have goodwill, you know, they're gonna be resistant to changing a system where they have power because that's scary. And again, to be honest, you have to put that on the table. Look, I'm afraid that, you know, I may not have as much power and freedom in this community that I've been in for the last 25 years if we really act to remove all biases. And yeah, you might not. You might have to share power. Um, but that's not a bad thing because if you share power with people who are as smart or smarter or bringing new perspectives that can really solve problems, then we're all moving forward. And power is not really what it's all about anyway. And to me, in science, it's about learning, understanding, and improving our existence in the world. So, you know, the only way we change that conversation, change those mindsets, is to really have difficult but honest conversations.
Sorry about the quality. It doesn't have those <laughs> things on them. Um, huh? The polka dots? Yeah, that's not in the in the film. Anyway, that final soundbite by Vernon Morris, he talks about power. Power is a really important part of the conversation, right? And he says, well, if we shared power or if there was an equal distribution of power, then it would be a, a better turnout for all of us. But do you remember, Amelia is gonna really be annoyed by this, but the, the very famous quote, science is, is power, like not, knowledge is power, right? Scientia is potentia. So actually at the core of Western science is this notion of using sci science or scientific knowledge towards power. That is the bedrock of all of this. So undoing that is the work that we're doing now, right? So moving on, a film that I'm working on right now is called Harm in the Water. We're looking at um, contaminants. <laughs> I think one of the most disappointing things that happened to me at UCLA that really led to me starting black and marine science was at the end of my PhD, literally, I had already submitted my dissertation, like it was done. All I had to do was graduate. <sighs> and I received this like forwarded email from my advisor, from my committee advisor. And basically in the email, she had said like a comment like, yeah, Tierra can't even write a complete sentence. I'm very concerned for her postdoc. And this was my, my next job. And yeah. it like, it really broke, it broke my heart because I was like, wait, what? Like I didn't, I had never received this feedback from her. Yeah. And it was just like, whoa, why is she telling these people I can't write a complete sentence? And we just did a whole dissertation. Like she just signed off on my dissertation. Yeah. And so that for me, really caused me to be very reflective because I was like, wow, if she doesn't think that I would be successful, why would she recommend me for this next job? Why would she sign off on my dissertation? And then I'm like, oh shit, my diversity scholarship is about to be up and she just had to get me out of the door. And so I think for that first time, I realized I was just like another like checkbox to her, even though I thought she was an ally. And it was, yeah, it was, it was devastating for me um, to, to go from that situation feeling literally like an imposter and like I had only gotten to UCLA because I was black and I had this diversity scholarship but I definitely hadn't earned it so yeah it was, it was very hard listening to my hype song. My hype song is Lose Yourself by Eminem. I listen to it before I do any talk or do any public speaking. It's like, it's a part and it's a, you gotta lose yourself, you only got one shot. You only got one shot to shine. Self in the music, the moment you want it, you better never let it go. You only get one shot, do not miss your chance. This opportunity comes once in a lifetime. You lose yourself, music, the moment you Let's see. Let's go. So who do y'all think took this picture? <laughs> so so I was there in the estuary 
as you can see, looks like I'm doing research, right? I'm here, I'm like doing mind my business, and I hear two folks, what are you doing down there? You're not supposed to be down there. I'm about to call the police. What? I'm, I'm like, hey, I'm a student. I have a permit. I go to UCLA and it's on the board. Like, please don't call the police. Like, I'm not doing anything wrong. Oh, you're a student? So this white couple now continues to walk towards me. Oh, well, what are you working on? Oh my gosh, can we help you with anything? Now my heart. Because you just said you're going to call the police on me. So now I'm afraid. Now I have to continue to do this research. Y'all know how it takes to get a permit and how long it takes to plan a field day. But now I'm here in this estuary. Like, how can I allow these white people to now help me? so they don't kill me. Could you take a photo? When we hear things like, I'll call the police on you, that is a visceral reaction for black people. I'm gonna just keep it 100 and be specific about who I'm talking about. Because we know black people are killed by the police disproportionately. In 2020 alone, we saw 164 black people. This year alone, we're still seeing murders. So you have, you're just, just doing research and somebody who thinks you don't belong weaponizes the police against you. That could have been the end of my story. I'm going to pause that clip there. So this, this film, Harm in the Water, is about various contaminants and how contaminants affect Black communities and how Black scientists are trying to fight their way into um, marine scientific spaces to do work in their own communities and how they find it very challenging to do so. So it's a multi-level piece of storytelling but it's been very eye-opening. I mean, just alone trying to find researchers coming from those communities has been really, really hard. Yeah, the numbers are very, very low in high volume black spaces and black communities, right? And that's too bad because then communities, they have, um, they have sick communities. The water is toxic, the air is toxic, and there's nobody in those communities who's able to say there's a problem here. Let's do something about it, right? Moving on, I want to show another clip. This is a film that we've been in production on. This is called Decolonizing Science. So getting back to the substructure of all of this, trying to examine the vestiges, the legacy of Western science and how this has an impact on all of the work that we're trying to do show a little bit of this. Again, those boxes are not Botany is colonialism. <laughs> colonialism is botany. These are intertwined. We are just beginning to understand how these things are entangled. But the question is who decides what belongs or not? 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years? How did the Western tradition arrive at the obsession with taxonomy, at the obsession with 
categorizing uh, the natural world with categorizing ways of knowing in the natural world and with attempting to control who had access to or who had the right to offer these sorts of definitions in the world. I think you're going to want to hear this. I come from 18 years as a Fed in Washington, D.C. Uh, at NASA headquarters, first as a program manager in the last two years running the Earth Science Division. In the interest of time, I want to keep this brief, but I genuinely want to thank all of you for agreeing to serve. Um, I think all of you understand the importance of this committee, that your work will be of short duration, but high impact. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Asquik Kwasen, Kanupiam at Aki at Nahaigansek. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the homelands of the Narragansett people. Um, I'm Loren Spears. I am Narragansett Niantic and I am the executive director of Tamaquag Museum. My goal, I guess, is certainly um, Native American representation, what I can bring to the committee and the group and perspective, um, and overarching social equity um, in representation. So, thank you. You asked me to provide a few key practical notes that uh, we should keep in mind while choosing the new name for the ship. Uh, the first point that comes to mind and probably the most important in regards to safety is that the name should be easily pronounceable. There are going to be many times when we'll have to transit through heavy vessel traffic in unfamiliar ports. Multiple radio conversations will be taking place simultaneously and radio chat can be easily misheard or confused. When you factor in reduced visibility or foul weather, problems are only multiplied, and there is absolutely no room for error in those situations. Uh, this is why the language used on the radio for ship-to-ship -ship comms is English, and that is mandated by in international regulations. Uh, foreign mariners, even those who don't consider English as their primary language, they're required to speak fluent English over the radio in order to avoid potentially catastrophic accidents uh, caused by miscommunication. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Is that off? Is it off? Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you what you thought on the record. <laughs> there was a moment where I saw you go, what was that? parts of that that was very uh, colonial um, in nature. I, I would say that our the, the point of including people into this process was to diversify, but the fact of the matter that the colonial world out there has decided that the whole entire world needs to speak English um, is is exactly what we're talking about. We're supposed to be decolonizing. And, and I agree that something needs to be easy to say, but I'm shocked when they say it has to be in English, um, which, you know, worldwide, I find that really offensive. Um, not just on behalf of indigenous people of this continent, but on behalf of people of the world that, um, that they're being forced to be colonized in in the maritime world in order to be out on the water you have to speak English that's unbelievable to me I never knew that so that was a shock um, well and the fact that they said the town or their port and so there was no acknowledgement or recognition of the fact that that is not a town and not a port but an indigenous community um, yeah, so that, that definitely rubbed the wrong way. I want to wrap it up with one last example. I have others, but in the interest of time, I want to jump down to slide 30. And um, as I said before, we opened Ocean Sciences, which is this huge, <laughs> very big conference. Um, 
I never knew that conferences could be so big until I went to AGU and Ocean Sciences. And I was like, whoa, okay, this is a conference. So they invited us to do a living documentary event and we opened the conference. And initially they said, Kendall, will you give the talk, the plenary? And I said, I will if I can give the stage to the local community. So I identified four people who I'd been working with because I'd been in production on Harm in the Water. And I said, let's just extend the documentary from this version to a live version and you can have the stage. And we co-created what you're about to see. So it was three folks from the African-American community all on the front lines. I mean, they are in the trenches of fighting contaminants in the water. And then one uh, individual, uh, you will see she's about to, to share her story with us. Her name is Monique Verdun. She's a, a enrolled member of the Helma Nation. What do the stars see? This is a photograph of my ancestors taken in the 1920s down by Yuponoshian. My two great grandmothers stand in the front line. And from that time in the late 1920s to today, so much has changed. The land has changed. Where my grandmother picked pecans, my cousins set their crab traps. And when the BP drilling disaster happened in 2010, people were pulling up their trawl nets with tar balls in them. And that lasted for a really long time. And to think about um, history for myself and to, to remember that, yes, I'm from the Homa Nation and also my mother's people were some of the first colonizers to this territory. St. James Parish is named St. James after a man named Jacques Cantrell, who's one of my great, 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 great grandfathers on my mother's side and was the commandant, the legal official of Cabano Sea. Cabano Sea was where the ducks roost and was also where my Homa ancestors were living on the back swamps and in relationship with Cantrell way back in those times. I think it's funny that in the 1970s, my parents found each other at the Deja Vu lounge in the French Quarter, but you know, life is funny and cycles of migration and, and how our spirits connect and how um, when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, how so much can change. When we allow ourselves to be generous and not greedy, how much more we all have. And in this place that is so rich, <laughs> we are also at the bottom of the list when it comes to quality education, healthcare, top of the list when it comes to poverty. This is, <laughs> this wealth that is created here off of our natural resources goes to bankers in Switzerland and these multinational corporations are making decisions that have generational consequences that my, my elder Vivienne lived through, witnessed, watched when the oil and gas men came in and found oil in the coastal territories in Pont Barre in the 1920s and was run off of that land. Our struggle with land loss did not begin with climate change, did not begin with the oil and gas industry. It is rooted to this practice of extraction and colonization. It is no coincidence that where plantations once sat, petrochemical plants and prisons now sit. One of the biggest prisons in the world, Angola, once a plantation now penitentiary and in the late 1600s was the primary village of the homa what do the stars see so i want to start to wrap up and i just want to say that these are all examples of 
the methods that I shared with you. So the work of ethical engagement, co-creation, all of these things were co-created. Problematizing together, trust building, all of that is embedded in what you saw here, okay? I'm hoping that this is the way we move forward, but I think it's gonna take a heavy lift and you all know why, because you work in your various spaces and there's a lot of resistance to this and it probably goes back to power, um, the legacy of, of you know, how you advance in institutional spaces, especially universities. So this will be very, very challenging, but I think it'll be worth it if we're committed to diversifying STEM. So that's what I have. Um, I would love to open this conversation up. I do wanna advance down to slide 33. I just wanna, um, some of my, my colleagues and friends and fellow travelers, people doing great work. You recognize Amelia. <laughs> um, Sunshine Menezes, Wendy Todd, um, Tiara Moore, Radna Tripathi, um, Justin Donovan at UCLA, Monique Verdun, who we just heard from, Catalina Martinez, uh, Melva Trevino Pena, uh, yeah, Lisa White, Brandon Jones at NSF texting me during this presentation. Um, yeah, these are like you all were, were in the trenches doing this work. And I thank you for your commitment and your creativity. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to share space with you at this time. So thank you. Anybody want to share some thoughts and reflections? And I hope that the exercise that we started sparks a conversation for you all going forward as you continue to, to workshop and discuss. But it's, it's something that I hope is planting a seed that can be infused into your future conversations as you move forward. Any comments or questions or thoughts? Um, so some of the obstacles are like lack of trust and you know questions about authenticity. So I don't know if you'll have an answer to this, but what about when researchers are neurodivergent who relate to people in very different ways than neurotypical people do? So that might create obstacles of trust, but then to hide that would be inauthentic um, to, to force another way of communication. So I'm curious your thoughts on that. I don't have an answer, um, but I know that work is being done in that area. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, I'm very interested in neurodivergence. I do research in that area. I'm working on a film around that and it's, it is fascinating to me. I mean, in the scientific community, there's a lot of neurodivergence and yet there's a lot of masking of it as well. And I hope that that is going to come to an end because there really is no reason to continue the violence of masking who you are. I mean, for any reason, but especially around that, right? And I think that there will probably moving forward, once we start to um, develop ways of listening and hearing and seeing and sharing and developing, co-developing ways of working together, communicating, I think that we're, we're not there yet, but I do see it starting to happen. You probably know more than I do about it. Um, but working, you know, in my little pocket in film around neurodivergence, I have found it very challenging to build trust because I'm not from that community. And I actually paused a project because I, I felt like a fraud. Like I felt like an actual researcher and I felt yucky about it, right? Because I didn't, um, other than having a real commitment to understanding and creating space, 
I felt like I was treading on somebody else's land without proper permission. And so I paused to work on my relationships and to develop a much deeper understanding and appreciation for how to work, but also bringing neurodivergent people into the work process with me. Cause it was a bunch of neurotypicals doing this stuff. Like we were literally studying a community and I realized in the middle of it that we were doing it wrong. So had the push pause period. And so now we have more people who are working on this side. Um, so I think that's hopefully where we're headed, that it's back to the co-creation, co-production, um, co-problematizing, because if you're not sharing it, I think it's highly problematic. But to follow up, like when the researcher is neurodivergent and the people that you're trying to get narratives from aren't, like, I, I don't, I'm neurodivergent and I'm learning it uh, that I am in at least two significant ways. This is part of sort of informed what I wrote about earlier because uh, I'm just learning it now. And then through the lens of seeing how I relate to people, which is very different, I could see how in my past that didn't work for some people. But if I really want to build a an authentic relationship to get a narrative or to understand something, I can't be authentic and change that method. So, I mean, part of the accountability might be disclosing that with the um, participant, but if they don't have like interactions with or understandings of, it could be, that could be a barrier to the trust no matter what you do. Some relationships are just not meant to work. And if that's the case in your situation, then sometimes you have to let it go. You can't force a relationship just because. And if people aren't willing to meet you on your terms, then I, I think you're just gonna have to be comfortable with saying this is just not, this isn't gonna work out for us. I know that's painful sometimes, but that is sometimes the only solution, right? So if you're struggling with relating to certain people because of that, have you had to make a hard decision? In life, I mean. Okay. Yeah, no, I didn't wanna do that. Right, right, yeah. Right, but I think being honest about when things aren't working is something that we all have to learn how to do right yeah because sometimes it's just way worse when you force something that shouldn't be forced no matter how much work you do it's still just at the end of the day might not be meant to be sometimes people just aren't going to get it no matter how much you have a difficult conversation you all know those people right Sometimes you just have to, for your own mental health and physical health, just back away, let it go. Yeah, that's hard though. That is really, really hard. That was a really good question though. Yeah, I wish I had a better answer and I, I would love to hear more. I would love to grow from your experiences. I, I really do wanna learn more. So if you're open to further conversations about it, I wanna, I would love to chat. Yeah. Other, other questions or comments? Corey? Yeah, I was curious, outside of you know, the, I know the movies have been around for a little bit, um, how much of that gets to audiences outside of STEM? You know, and the reason I'm asking, you know, I was thinking about the example of Tara and you know, the, you know, the, the couple and they call one, they're gonna call the police. I think a lot of you know, marine scientists of color have had that experience. Like, you know, for example, it's one of the reasons I, even though I was in Monterey Bay, I didn't work there for about 10 years because in my early years there, and, you know, a lot of my students, initial students were students of color, uh, people were calling the police on them. I remember getting a call like 2, 2.30 in the morning, it was like a deputy from Monterey County Sheriff because somebody had called accusing them of being poachers. <clears throat> and it was after like a few of those where I was like, you know, this, this can go sideways. And this was back in like 2009, 2010, you know, so you know, pulled them out of there. And, you know, we, we never went back until a few years, you know, I started this drone program and then, you know, it started up again. We talk about this in the Cal Academy, you get a lot of these groups that they self-deputize 
right? And it's kind of another form of, you know, segregation almost like they're keeping people. And I had to talk with the sanctuary about this, you know, and they're really uncomfortable having that conversation. Like, I remember asking directly, are these folks actually like empowered to do anything? Well, no. And when you kind of get into it, some of them are donors, right? So like the sanctuary foundation, that's the big fear is that they're going <clears> to <throat> upset them. Like, I know even like a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine at Loyola Marymount, you know, Hispanic scientist called the cops on her because she was out there with her students are there. And so there's, I guess, more broadly, I think outside of STEM, you've got communities out there where they don't really, they, they have a model of what a marine scientist looks like, right? It's that Jacques Gusteau-esque type of thing, you know, that's out there. If you don't fit that model, then clearly you're up to something, right? You're, you're doing something wrong out there. You're, you're up to no good. And so that's why I was curious if you've got, if this goes outside of the STEM community, it seems even outside of that, you know, to that point is there's kind of a broader world out there that has to kind of understand that marine scientists don't all look the same have you met tiara yeah yeah, yeah. i've never known yeah. That, yeah so she will step outside of stem to let the world know what's going on with her and she uses social media to do that so i would say yes it is outside of stem and it's because of her bringing it to other spaces for sure yeah, that's scary and upsetting. And I'm horrified. Like, why? What? It, it's, ugh, it just is endless. Oh, I mean, they must understand that. I mean, we could end up murdered, killed. I like, guess not a trivial endeavor to call the police on, you know, people of color doing research. That is insanity right there. The only reason, like, over the one of the reasons it came up again is because when we started the drone program, they called the cops again, but on someone else's student happened to be a white student, and that got people all of a sudden, like, oh, wait, this is a real issue. Where they're like, yeah, like we've been telling you this, but yeah, it, it kind of takes that, right, to, to do that. So that's why I was curious, like, outside of like who's consuming this information, you know, about what a marine scientist looks like. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, like I said, it is, it is making its way out, and it just drones my gosh we were shooting in st louis and i said to my drone operator alex i said i give it five minutes the cops will show up in five minutes and i was sitting for whatever reason our rental car was a, a bmw suv like it was a nice car i was i said i'm not getting out of the car so you get out he's white i say you go <laughs> and sure enough this guy came strolling up with eating a bag of chips. He's like, what are you doing in our neighborhood? He couldn't see the drone. He couldn't hear it because it was so high. And Alex was just standing there. He's like, oh, we're just waiting for somebody. We've done some very shady. There have been times actually when we should have been called, you know, because we were shooting illegally. But anyway, unacceptable. It is <laughs> finding its way out, but maybe not to the extent where it's changing behavior. That is an uphill battle. Yeah, Kiki. Oh, thank you. I'm reflecting on a question that Nikki asked NSF earlier. I want to apply it to ourselves. Like, what does success look like for us? I mean, we have you here to help us figure out how we're going to collect these narratives. And I certainly had things in my head going into it. I love the fact that you brought up decentering because I think this is where we've often failed in doing science narratives. We always center the science. It's always what did science lose because we don't have diversity. And so decentering the science and centering the human experience, yes. But as I was also looking at this and feeling what I felt, and I resonate that same experience of being in the field and having people shout out the window things that I know were things at me and being driven off the road by people with Confederate flags and being followed home every day from the Marine Lab by the cops for the first year and a half that I was in grad school. I know that feeling and I felt it, like it, it brought tears to my eyes and I realized this, this feeling is part of success because I've watched narratives where people of color were kind of saying the things, and like they were half saying the things. A lot of this happened after uh, George Floyd. They're like, we're gonna have the narratives of the black experience, the brown experience. And they, it was still kind of the code, like how, what's your capacity to be able to handle the thing that I had to say? And I could just call it, I'm like, that's not your real story. 
that's as much as you feel safe putting out, that's as much as you think that people can receive. But I was looking at those stories and it was just like, boom, boom, boom. And I was like, I want for whoever identities were being centered for them to look at these narratives and go truth, 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 even if it hurts. That to me, I thought that's success. But here's a question. What you told us today is to do this well, to do this authentically, to do this building trust. We have to have in the mix of people who are creating it, shared identity and understanding. We have this charge that brings in, I mean, we're centering race and ethnicity, but we also are getting into intersectionalities and we want to have that there as well, functionally. And with this time frame that we have, how can we do that? Like, can you give us guide in our budget? Um, can you give us guidance of how we can do this work and not get to the point where you were just talking about, oh wait, we're, we're studying people, we're extracting people. I don't wanna do that. Help us with that. I don't know what your budget is, <laughs> but it's probably not big enough. <laughs> no. Um, so people ask me this all the time and I have to set expectations. So I have to establish a scope so that I can actually achieve those expectations. And have you started at that place or are you just starting to get there because this is overwhelming and it's a lot bigger than you had anticipated and you have to sort of shape shift what you're doing because of the size and depth of it. Have you talked about changing the scope of what you've set out to do? Because now you're starting to really appreciate how enormous this is. Well, I would say that we have liberty within this committee to shape the scope of the narrative collection to with anything in the charge. I mean, the charge is what it is for the report, but for the narratives, we can go where we want to go. And I would say that from the beginning, there was an idea that there are some usable narratives out there already. Um, this is about supplementing places where we see egregious holes. We haven't quite done all that work yet of figuring out where those egregious holes are, um, but still that said and done, I don't think that they are great models of narratives that about scientists and science that decenters the science. And I, I, I would say that I don't know of the National Academies having ever done that particularly well. So, um, so there's a process thing with an institution thing that we also have to figure out. Okay. Um, so ditto, yes, there isn't a lot of examples around decentering, but also I just want to reiterate the fact that I've raised these points for, for discussion. Okay. This is for you to decide if this is valid for the work that you're doing. You can, I raise them for them to be dismissed. I have no attachment to what I brought to you today. So if it doesn't fit within the scope or process or agenda or purpose or motivation of what you're doing, then throw it out. I'm just merely bringing things to your attention. If it works for you, great. Not if decentering, and it sounds like, um, you know, if decentering doesn't work for the committee, it works for you, but maybe it doesn't, work. maybe there'll be a fight. I see your face. You want it in there. I want it in there. Um, but, but anyway, the point is, is that I guess as a committee, you have to decide what it is that needs to go into this report and you have to make that decision collectively. That's going to be a hard discussion and it's about quality over quantity. So it might just be three main important points and then three narratives that really make the point that you're trying to make. And maybe it comes from this work around decentering. You don't need, is that the fire alarm? Oh dear. Oh, okay. All right. So the, so the point is, is, is definitely quality over quantity. So I don't want you to be overwhelmed thinking I have to go find 50 stories. Trust me, you're not going to find them around decentering. I do this work. It's not out there. We're really doing something pretty, I mean, I'm not, this isn't ego. I know, cause I've done the research. There's not a lot of it. Okay. So um, I'm just saying that. Anyway, yes. So I think you need to focus on quality over quantity. I hope that'll help um, with not being so overwhelmed with what you think needs to go into the report.
Um, sorry, I don't think we can hear. No, I'm okay. I'm okay. I was just okay. going to add something. I'm passing the Javier okay. then. Thank you. Thank you, Kendall. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully this is a follow up instead of a digression. Um, because I, I found the presentation really, really useful, and I'm interested, you know, in your thoughts about process. Um, so I mean, I hear Kiki about the need to say some truths that need to be said, whatever those truths are, whatever truth is. Um, I hear about what needs to, you know, we need to make hard decisions about what needs to go into the report, quality over quantity. Um, at what point do we start thinking, what is the language and how to say things so that we don't preach to the choir so they can be heard? And how much in your experience that needs to be, at what point that needs to be discussed because that might be a limiting factor about what can be said. Like if we find really good ways in which we say the hard things so they can be heard, does that determine the stories we can say? Or you, you reverse it in terms of process. You decide what needs to go into the report and then no matter how, how it's said, it goes into the report. But in my experience, and, and I mentioned it in the last session, you know, designing this course at Tuk where, you know, there were some very heavy issues. I mean, at Tuk about racism, right? And so we want to have a, a class that everybody took, took about racism. We decided that we needed to figure out how to design the class that will not preach to the choir. I'm, I'm afraid that we write a report that preaches to the choir. How do we avoid that? I ask what's wrong with preaching to the choir if people don't want to come in to it, then we're centering them. And is that what we want to do? So, I mean, I think we can have an overall bigger conversation about audience, but all the literature and material, I mean, I shouldn't say all, but a lot of the literature and material that are out there have already been designed for those people in mind. So, you know, and if they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. Um, and so I think it's good to be inclusive, but we have to not center white supremacy. And we're so used to doing that because that's how we have to navigate our jobs and our life. But I think that we need to be careful about about sliding too far of like, of not, um, why can't we center us? And if that makes people uncomfortable, that makes them uncomfortable, you know, and use our own voice, which may be uncomfortable. I, you know, just throwing that out there because after you had said that comment before, I was like, ooh. <laughs> We, we, we got to come back and talk about that um, because it does start to get into, and maybe this is just a, in the closed session, what we needed to think about is like, who is our audience? Mm -hmm. Right. I, I think that's partly what I'm asking. Who's our audience? Yeah. Sorry. That's a really good segue into our break, which we're about 15 minutes over, but I think this has been fantastic. Um, can we give a round of applause? Thank you so much, Kendall, for joining us today. Um, I foresee some follow-up questions. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, not having more satisfying responses, not fully understanding the context of your work. Oh, no, you did great. Oh. It was perfect. <laughs> no, you did a great job. Um, it, it was perfect. Uh, and you know, all of this is, it's, it's our hope that it sparks great conversation. That's the, you know, that's what we bring folks in too. Um, so thank you very much. Um, this was wonderful.
And um, for those online, uh, we are ending the public session today. We'll start again at um, 9 a.m. Pacific tomorrow. From 9 to 12, we'll have public sessions. Um, so thank you for joining us, and I hope to see you again tomorrow.